Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey guys, welcome to episode 239 of the Team House. We are here today with our guest, Daniel. Uh, Daniel served as a crew chief with 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, uh, mostly or entirely on the uh, MH-47 platform. Uh, also deployed with a previous guest of ours, Alan Mack. Uh, so we're really happy to have him on the show tonight. Um, quick shout out to Augusta Precious Metals for supporting the show and being a sponsor. We really appreciate having them. Um, and uh, Daniel, uh, you know, without further ado, man, um, thank you for coming on the show tonight. Thank you very much for having me on board. Yeah, man. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your upbringing and sort of what led you towards military service. Um, yeah, <laughs> my, uh, my dislike for school pretty much uh, sent me in the military way. I grew up in a little small town in Missouri, um, Osage Beach, Missouri, down the Lake of the Ozarks. Um, not the Ozarks, north of there. That's fighting words if you call me from the Ozarks. Um, but yeah, I was just a uh, you know, middle-of-the-road school kid. Uh, I was always well-behaved, but when it came to uh, homework and study habits, it was not my uh, cup of tea. So um, my best friend at the time that I didn't know till. Uh, after I had already joined the army as the guy that sent the army recruiter to my door. <laughs> so came and uh, talked with him and you know, told me, Hey, you want to travel the world and do fun stuff and get some money for college? And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> you know, my, my parents were both uh, Navy back during the uh, Vietnam era and my grandparents and all that. My brother had served in the army in the late eighties, early nineties. So I thought, yeah, sure. Why not? Let's, let's give it a try. So off I went and, uh, Went up to the uh, MEP station up in St. Louis, Missouri, and watched a uh, little video. I'd always been in love with tanks. You know, they're cool. They, they drive around and blow each other's gas. And I always had a love for helicopters. I don't know. I don't know where that came from, but it was pretty cool. So I was sitting in the lobby at the MEP station, and I don't know if you remember a show called uh, Firepower on Discovery Channel came on. It showed a tank rolling through the desert, blowing up stuff. I was like, yep. That's it. And the very next screen showed a helicopter finder missile and blowing up the tank. So I walked to the crew while I was sitting there and said, hey, uh, that helicopter job, I'll take it. Sounds cool. Off I went. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't really know too much about what you volunteered for. You just knew you wanted to be in rotary wing aviation somewhere. Oh, yeah. And it's, um, I mean, it's even, it's even worse than that. Uh, my official MOS um, at the time, 67 uniform, and then, you know, they changed the MOSs around and became 15 uniform. Uh, but my MOS is a helicopter repairer. I, I signed up as a helicopter mechanic. Um, and when I showed up at Fort Eustis, Virginia, in uh, August of 2094, mm. uh, you know, I, I thought I was going to be just a general helicopter mechanic. That's that's the laser disc, aging ourselves a little bit, but that's the laser disc they showed me at the uh, MEP station was... Fixing all, you know, Apaches, Cobra, and Hueys. I thought this was great. And then all of a sudden, we walked through the hangar on our first day, and I'm like, uh, what is this? What, what is this school us dumpster looking thing? And they're like, oh, yeah, this, this is your life for the next. And for our job, it was six years. The initial enlistment was six years. Wow. So, okay, well, I'll just, I'll be a helicopter mechanic and see how it goes. And uh, I, had, at the time, I had no idea that, you know, being a crew chief on anything flying, was was an option. Um, I didn't realize that till I I got to Panama, and I was like, "Who's the, who's the cool guys in uh, flight suits that are never at PT in the morning?" And that was a that's the flight platoon. I said, uh, "I want it. How do I do that?" <laughs> Spent uh, six months in maintenance and the rest of my career, uh, the last nineteen years flying on the back. Was uh, was the enlistment six years because the initial training was so long? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, some of those MOSs where they, you know, the, the training's kind of long and it's technical and, you know, if they're going to they're gonna do that, they want they want somebody with some longevity. Right. Um, I initially kind of asked about, you know, what's a medic or whatever, you know, something, someone to give me a good job on the outside. But, yeah, so um, T-School up at Fort Eustis, Virginia was, 
see, I got there in, let's see, August, September. Actually, I got there in October. It was about six months, about six months long. And so if you're, if you're going from scratch, like, you know, you didn't happen to have a helicopter in your garage. So you're, you know, you're hands on for the first time. What it, what is six months of, you know, helicopter maintenance like? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, the first three weeks, um, it's the front load and it's all, um, learning the, the manuals, the maintenance manuals, um, you know, because every, I mean, the helicopter is big. Um, you guys have been in the back of you seen how big those things are. Um, lots of lots of systems, subsystems. So the first three weeks is learning the maintenance manuals, and it's like, you know, it's about ten books. You know, that's you know, two inches thick, and then you got troubleshooting manuals that are, you know, four of those which are huge. So it's learning the, the you know, the maintenance, the manuals, the uh, the record system because. I mean, it's it's still a helicopter that flies, so you still got to follow, you know, FAA guidance and you know, civilian pieces and parts as well. So, um, you know, learning the, kind of some of the aspects on that, some of the inspection techniques um, and procedures, um, you know, not just, um, you know, part broke, take off the new part on, but you take that part off, clean it, inspect it. Um, you know, the helicopter goes through periodic maintenance, period, you know, every so many flight hours. It goes through little inspections, and then you know every couple hundred hours we tear the thing apart. So that's the first few weeks, and then the rest of it is just each individual system. You go through the you know the engine systems and the hydraulics, and then electrical systems, and then cargo handling. So it just breaks that thing down into pieces, and you get to kind of know. Um, and, and then you get to kind of know that engineers are very weird people, and how they put stuff together does <laughs> not make sense. So I mean, everybody's familiar working on their cars. Um, you know, like it's a simple thing like changing a spark plug. Now imagine doing that on turbine engines that, you know, sitting on top of a helicopter 20 feet up in the 120 degree Afghani sun. Yeah. Makes things a little sporty. But yeah, it's just, it's just a whole lot of technical, um, you know, learning. And some of it's also the basic concepts of not just learning the pieces and parts, but how they work. Right. Uh, I mean, you guys have seen that when you just sit inside and you look up and you see all those pipes and tubings and all that stuff. Yeah, we know what every piece is, what everything does. So, yeah, so it's pretty long. I mean, for 20 years, I was still learning. I mean, yeah. even up until the, the point I retired, I was still learning stuff. Do, uh, do, the, do, the, do different parts of the helicopter evolve at different times? And if so, how does that create challenges for you guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when I when I retired, I was teaching at the maintenance test pilot course down at Fort Rucker, Alabama, for big army guys, and the big army had the Fox model Chinooks, you know, the F models, which was kind of like a, a slimmed down version of the G model that uh, we had in the regiment, and then prior to that was the Echo. So you know, with every model change, it's basics are the same, but it, it's a new helicopter, and then individual pieces and parts. Um, can sometimes update, you know, the engines go through upgrades. Um, it, it was very common in the 160th. Um, you know, we had, a little, we had a little cell down at the end of the runway that their sole purpose in life was, you know, take a piece. How can we make it bigger and better? How can we fit it on the helicopter? And then we got to learn it. Yeah. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was just about the time you think you're the smartest guy in the world. They come out with new stuff and you're like, shit, okay, mm -hmm. I'm starting over. Yeah. So, yeah. So you, you, but, yeah, I mean, it was, Oh, sorry. please. Yeah, I mean, in my, in my 20 years, you know, I went from, you know, the big army Delta models to the regimental echoes. And then we replaced the echoes with the golfs. And then I went from golfs to big army on the Fox models. So I went through four, four models of the 47. Yeah. And so four years down in Panama, you were able to make that switch from mechanic over to crew chief. Uh, what, what, and what was it like uh, down in Panama at that time? Um, that's, I mean, people who were stationed down there back in the day speak very highly of it. Um, I, I found. Uh, it was the, it was the army's little hidden secret. Um, I got there in March of uh, March, April of 95. Um, I remember leaving, you know, leaving Virginia um, I said, you know, blue jeans, you know, flannel shirt, jacket. I get off the airplane in, uh, you know, in Panama at Takuman Airport, and I thought I was dying. 
you know, like what, what, where, where am I? <laughs> what did I just do? But yeah, that place was um, amazing. Um, as far as us, um, we had just one little aviation battalion, you know, some you know, big army Blackhawks. Um, and then the 47 side of the house, we only had eight, you know, we had eight ships and we supported everything, you know, from Mexico down to the tip of South America. Um, but the thing that really kind of ignited my, my fire for what I want to do in the future was we had a, a small little detachment from uh, the 160th guys. Um, at the time, it was called the 617th SOAD, and then uh, you know they later became part of uh, the 3rd Battalion guys here. Um, but we were fortunate enough that we got to do some work with them. Um, you know, sometimes it was doing you know, doing passive training, um, you know, over the jungle school, or you know, doing fat cow missions, you know, flying out um, to an island and you know, setting up a farm site. So just kind of getting exposed to that, and then um, the other thing that kind of made me decide that I wanted to be special someday was um, getting to work with the uh, the SEALs that were rotating through. Um, we had Charlie Company, 3rd of the 7th, which was down there on Fort Clayton, Panama. Um, those guys were awesome. Um, you know, super group, super great group of guys. Um, we had such a, a good relationship. You know, we do a lot of, um, you know, static line jumps with them. We do their halo drops. Um, we go down in the canal and do their, uh, you know, helicast operations, you know, whether it was boats, um, we got to do ladders, um, ladders with them, repelling. So it was almost like kind of being a little, you know, miniature special operations unit um, without all the fancy toys. Um, so when I shut up and, you know, I go to the maintenance platoon and I'm like scrubbing the cracks of the hangar floor and, you know, cleaning out the butt cams. I was like, this sucks. Um, I want to I go do the things that I hear those stories about the guys at the bar talking about, so. Um, about six months into it, um, they held a flight platoon board, you know, just a promotion board, a selection board, basically. And uh, one of the books that we had that were given in uh, AIT was called the, uh, the Dash 10. It's the operator's manual. It's the Bible. It is the 47 Bible. It tells you how everything works, not details, but the overall basics, you know, nomenclature stuff. You point at it and, you know, uh, what's this? It's a red Solo cup full of rum and coke great awesome so you know you knew what it was what it's called how it works um aircraft limitations emergency procedures basically everything the pilot knows about the cockpit stuff everything in the back studied it had a couple of flight platoon guys helping me out and uh went to the board and uh i mean i'm just a you know i think at the time maybe one year in the army i'm an e2 got my little mosquito wings <laughs> and one of the you know e4s e5 I even had a couple of sixes that had been in the army 10, 12 years and never flown and wanted to do it. And, uh, they picked me and I never stopped. So I, I flew for about three and a half years in Panama as a crew chief there, progressed up. So, you know, in the 47 world, it's a touchy subject. So I'll kind of let this one slide for you guys because nobody knows better. But, um, in the 47 world, being called a crew chief is kind of almost a degrading thing <laughs> because that's what, that's what we start off as, but in the in the big world, that's what everybody knows it as. But um, you progress up from being a crew chief to a flight engineer, and then from flight engineer up to standards. Um, so I started off, you know, as a crew chief with everybody else, and then um, got really good at working on the airplane, fixing it, started getting a good reputation with the pilots. That you know, hey, um, and the the other guy I worked with, um, his name was Randy. His nickname was Stubby, just a little short guy. Um, our airplane was always perfect. Um, it was clean. You know, there was no issues. We, we took it, babied it like it was our car. And uh, I just kept working up, became a flight engineer. So basically, when you, when you become a flight engineer, you, you get your own. You, it's kind of like, you know, you get to put your name on the side. That's mine. So, you know, when people are talking about, you know, 105 or 135, the tail numbers, it's Dan's airplane, Randy's airplane. So it, it starts, it takes on your own, your own persona. And uh, so, yeah, we started doing that. Can and, uh, Daniel, before jumping on to the next thing, could, could you take just a moment to explain to the people out there who are not familiar what a crew chief does, what a flight engineer does, how they interact with the pilots, and, and really what that job entails? Yeah, um, you know, starting off, you have um, Big Army has two people. You have two people assigned to each aircraft, and it's theirs. I mean, it's, it's on it, it's your airplane. 
Um, the flying engineer is the senior crew member that's basically in charge. It's his. He signs the hand receipt. He signs for all the equipment. It's it's his responsibility to make sure that thing is, you know, fully mission capable all the time. And then assigned to him is a crew chief, which is usually a, a new flight guy. So they're coming from a maintenance platoon. You know, we're coming from another duty station, and then they're yours. So the two of you, you, you take care of you all stuff, and then um, as you progress, as you learn, because you know there is no, there's no school for being a crew chief. It's literally on the job training. You know, they give you a give you a couple books, give you a checklist. Um, they give you what's called a call and response because um, every if you guys have ever been on the airplane plugged in, you hear a lot of talk back and forth between the front end and the back end, um, especially when you're starting up, shutting down. And performing flight duties, it's it's an orchestrated event. So, you know, every time the pilot says something, he calls it out. You respond. He calls it out. You respond. So, you know, the first few months is just learning that. You know, where do I stand when we start an engine? Where do I stand when we start the auxiliary? Where do we stand when I'm doing whatever? So that's kind of that flight engineer's job is to make sure the aircraft is up and running all the time, and to train that new crew chief to become a flight engineer someday as well. And then he'll move over and get his own airplane. And then when it comes to the mission side of the house, it's the uh, mission planning. Uh, Big Army, we didn't really do much. Everything was done by the pilots. They, you know, we just went out to the aircraft, got it ready, and we just sat there waiting for everybody to show up. And then, you know, the teams would show up, the passengers, whoever. We'd load the cargo. Um, we might do a quick little, you know, safety brief. You know, don't touch this, don't touch that. Sit down, buckle your seatbelt, shut up, and get off when I tell you to. You know, probably heard some of those. Um, and then when it came to the mission stuff was, you know, executing whatever facet it was. Um, when I got to the regiment, um, it was a very eye-opening experience on how involved, and it, and it got a lot more involved as time went on, as, as the GWAT went on, on how much more involved we became in the mission planning cycle of it. Um, you know, sitting in Afghanistan, the planning centers, I had a desk right there at the head table. You know, you had the, the pilots on one. It was kind of a U-shaped thing. You had pilots ran down one side. At the head of the table, you had um, the uh, air mission commander. You had the flight lead. And then right next to him was me. Um, that's, you know, where, that's where Al Mack comes into play. He dragged me around the, the globe a couple times. Um, but you're in there to kind of take the, the load off of them um, because the, you know, the mission sets were very detailed and, and sometimes very complex that, they didn't need to worry about that stuff. You know, there was the mission. They, they met with the ground force guys. They come in and say, hey, Dan, here's how much weight we have. Can we do it? Where we got to put this stuff? Can we load this? And then a lot of times it was meeting up with the various kids, you know, doing face-to-face with them. And, you know, especially as time went on, it was very understanding, um, you know, because they look at a helicopter and go, what do you mean I can only take six people? You're a flying school bus. Well, yeah, but <laughs> we're going to 20,000 feet helicopters have limitations too so we became an, an integral part of in that mission planning we we're called enlisted planner um, was our official official title um, and that's what i eventually did a lot of but yeah that's kind of the the role of the crew chief versus flight engineers the crew chief is just a a young new crew member that's that's learning the ropes and working his way up and then he gets qualified to basic mission fully mission and then he'll take a flight engineer check ride um get signed off on that and then hey you know here's your aircraft and here's your crew you know don't screw it up and get fired. Well, I don't know why yeah. D doesn't like you, but he demoted you in the uh, title to, to, uh, yeah, he demoted you to crew chief in the title of uh, the video, the interview. I- yeah, but uh, <laughs> it just simplifies stuff because everybody knows, you know, when, when everybody says, you know, oh, I was a flight engineer, you're like, oh, so you flew. I was like, no, because they think of a guy sitting behind the pilot in, in a jet, you know, doing stuff. So, yeah, crew chief. It, it's good, but yeah, I mean, you you go out to the hangars at Fort Cam and you say, hey, uh, "Are you a crew chief?" They say it's the wrong guy, and you know you're gonna get taped to a chair and taken out to the bird bath. <laughs> do you uh, want to do? Uh, yeah, this, uh, sure. Here real quick. So our first sponsor for tonight is Fume. That's F U with an umlaut M. Fume. Um, look, Jack. You know what sucks? What sucks, Dave? Cold turkey. And it doesn't matter if you're eating it uh, or using it as a method to as, quit. As you can see, I don't know much about that. Well, I mean, there's a reason they call quitting cold turkey cold turkey because cold turkey is the worst meat you could ever put on a sandwich. But 
there's a better way to break your bad habits. And, you know, we're not talking about standing naked in front of the mirror, cursing yourself out, <laughs> as Jack and I have both done <laughs> to uh, each together. Self-criticism yeah. <laughs> sessions. Um, but uh, <laughs> we're talking about our sponsor, Fume. Uh, they look at a problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning, flavored air device. Uh, I lost my spot. Uh, instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. It uses your lungs. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, Fume is good. <laughs> it's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow, so it spins and it, it, you know you can adjust the draw. Um, uh, an airflow dial and is designed with move, uh, movable parts and magnets for fidgeting. I have been using this as a fidget spinner. So the way this works is it just comes out like that. It's magnetized at a certain oh, You're it's field magnetized at a certain point. So it uses these really cool little uh, tubes. Um, I like the maple pepper. It's it's like standing in a Moroccan spice it market. Smells good in the Canadian forest and taking a deep breath in. Now. It might be a little bold for some of you. That's okay. They've got you covered. Orange vanilla, raspberry lemon. You know, breathe at your own level. Um, <laughs> but it tastes great. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. There's no reason that can't be you. And even if you're not trying to, you know, kick a bad habit, it's a good habit to have. Um, join Fume in Accelerating Humanity's Breakup from Destructive Habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume, that's F-U-M, uh, dot com, tryfume dot com, and use Team House to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfume, T R Y F U M dot com, and use T Mouse. And our second sponsor tonight is Augusta Precious Metals. So if you're like me, you've wanted to buy gold for years. There's lots of commercials out there, but who can you really trust? I didn't want a bad investment, but I didn't want to miss the boat either. Sound familiar? Fortunately, we've got great news. If you have an IRA or 401k and want to buy physical gold, eliminate fear and uncertainty from the process using new gold IRA company integrity checklists. It helps you evaluate and choose the best gold IRA company. I use it to personally vet Augusta Precious Metals and they are absolutely phenomenal. Use this checklist to choose the best gold IRA company. To get your free gold IRA company integrity checklist today, text TEAM to 68592. Again, text T-E-A-M to 68592. That's TEAM to 68592 or go to augustapreciousmetals.com and you know what else is precious our guest daniel oh back to you um when you became a crew chief did is there a flight formal, engineer uh, no for the crew chief is there a formal training for that you go to school or is it all on the job So um, in the in the conventional army, it is um, it's all on the job training. Um, they'll do kind of a like a ground school, but it's internal. You know, it's your um, you have you know kind of like Al Mack was the the regimental forty seven guy. Right next to him, you have the non rated crew member. That's the official thing, the non rated crew member guy, um, otherwise known as an SI, who's the standardization instructor. So all the way from you know. The great, you know, brigade, battalion, all the way down to the company has their own. And so you kind of do a ground school with them where they kind of go through some basic academics. Um, you go through aeromedical, you know, so you learn, um, you know, the effects of hypoxia. You know, because we do fly at altitudes and sometimes we don't always have oxygen and sometimes the oxygen doesn't always last. Um, to, you know, um, even some silly, what's the effect on smoking or dead? Uh, I don't see any next 
and cause you to, to have bad performance because you definitely don't want to do that when you're, you know, on helicopters, whether you're flying in the front or, you know, watching systems in the back. So it's kind of just an in-house thing. And then um, he has, that SI has a couple guys that are qualified as a, as an FI, a flight engine instructor. Those guys actually go to a formal school down in Fort Rucker. Um, it's about, it's about right around two months long. And that's where we actually learn you know, methods of instruction, how to be, how to be an instructor, how to teach. Um, the regiment, we had our own. Um, we had our own schoolhouse um, for, for pretty much everybody. So at for now, I think it's so at B because it's turned into a battalion. It used to be a company, but it's the Special Operations Aviation Training Company. So when you were selected, you may or may not go to that, that school. If you came from Big Army and you had training, like me, I already had experience. I had a couple hundred flight hours, um, had done a lot of um, non-standard mission stuff that most Big Army people didn't. So when I got there, they said, no, you're just going to go through, uh, we call it Echo Model School. It was two weeks. Learn the differences between a Delta and an Echo, you know, because suddenly you're going from old speed gauges to, you know, a cockpit, a lot of electronic stuff, a lot of, a lot of systems, you know, that, that keep that aircraft alive. Um, so the SOATC, you know, the training company, that was the official schoolhouse for, for those. And it was, uh, I think it was 80, 85 days, something like that. And, um, we basically took a guy that had no or very limited experience and we trained him up on what we call the big three. So you, you would learn the basics, you know, here's where to stand, here's what to say. And then you would get trained up on um, in-flight refueling, rescue hoist, and um, mini guns. So hoist guns and, uh, and fuel. Um, because I can put a guy up in front of the right position and the left or right gun if they can do those three, they can do any mission that's out there. Yeah. So if we got to refuel, they know how to read the checklist. They know how to flip the switches, open the valves, refuel the, air, the, the airplane. You know, get qualified on any gun, uh, it's your bread and butter. And then rescue hoist because it's right during the door. And then as you would progress up from there, the rest of it is done in house. So when okay. it goes to the you know the the advanced mission, fast roping vehicles, far, you know all that kind of stuff, that was trained in house by our, our unit trainers. So when you went from being a mechanic to, uh, to uh, part of the flight crew, uh, were you, were you like better than everybody else? I mean, did you like kind of kick all, all of your old, like, uh, like grease monkeys, you know, all the wrench turners to the, to the curb? Um, I, I would like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one of those where I knew, you know, I wasn't the, I wasn't the, the smartest guy because yeah, I had been around forever, but um, I was pretty, I was pretty shit hot. I mean, you could, uh, but my hardest thing, and then some of the old guys used to give me a lot of crap for it, is I would have a hard time remembering what the proper nomenclature was for something. You know, what's, what's that thing called? And I'd be like, uh, it's a, it, it's cup. And they're like, no, that's a drinking receptacle device. You know, we all army anybody in the right. like fancy shit up right so i would it's the in the hickey the whatchamacallit the whatever it is but if you want to know what it does i can tell you what it does i'll tell you how it works how to take it off take it on inspect it so that was kind of even at my little selection board um the guy that was on the board was the uh, standard guy at the time Chef Eric Schaub, uh, he passed away a few years ago it was awesome uh, it was one of my one of my first mentors that really inspired me and, and lit that fire to become, you know, the best crew chief that I could. Um, he's been on the board. He's like, I got a question for him. And he held up the part. I don't know what it was. He's what it's called. And I just started laughing. I was like, oh, man, I'm done. <laughs> he's got me. But, yeah, I mean, when it came to the mechanic stuff, um, I was just always the guy that was there. You know, I didn't smoke. So, you know, when all the smokers going to smoke break, I was out working, you know, doing stuff. Um you know, the flight guys came in and said, "Hey, I got I I got some maintenance that needs to be done. I need I need support. I need two guys." I go. And a lot of the maintenance guys they didn't want to do that. They just wanted to do the lazy stuff. Like, and you know, it's hot out there in Panama where it rains. Yeah. You know, six months out of the year. Um. So I said, I don't give a shit. I'm I'm going. So that's where I got to get on the real good side of the flight guys and show them that hey, you know, this is cool. I I want to be you when I grow up. 
So now when that opportunity presented itself, I, I jumped on it and I was like, I'll be damned if any of these guys are going to beat me out. I'm, that's my job. I'm taking it. So what and was I, it? <laughs> Mentality that's awesome. Daniel, we lost you on that last part. You broke up a bit. Can you repeat that, please? You might want to make sure you're speaking directly at the computer. Oh, yeah. So, no, I was just saying that, um, you know, I wasn't going to let anything jeopardize that that job, that, that opportunity, because it's you – know, and hearing from some of the other guys that had come from other Army units, you know, from Big Army, was it's a very coveted position. You know, it's, it's where everybody wants to be. You know, the, it was kind of looking back, it got, it gets people out of a lot of stuff. You know, there's a division run. Oh, I got a flight, you know, yeah. Hey, we got a whatever in the morning. Oh, sorry. Um, crew rest. I flew last night. <laughs> so a lot of people wanted it for that, but I just wanted it. Because it was awesome. I wanted to go out there and do it. So um, I wouldn't do anything take it i wasn't gonna let some of the other guys and i think that's what i was saying whenever i got cut off was that mentality kind of kept me even for the rest of my career was i saw an opportunity and said hey i want that and i'll do what i need to do i'll learn what i need to learn i'm, I'm gonna get that because it's mine i want it and so how did you uh, make the jump over to 160th like how did that come about so um we had a um we had two guys that came um, that had PTS from work Campbell and came out of and two guys, each one came from second battalion out of uh, Fort Campbell, but they came from both companies. We had the flight companies were A and B, the outcome company, Bravo company. Um, and at the time, you know, pre GWAT, they were very different. Um, you know, a company worked with these guys, B company worked with those guys. There was a, we shared the same building, but there was a wall to be thick in the middle of that building. Um, when the guy came down, um, one guy had been with the regiment for, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years. Um, the other guy had been there for a long time. Was, um, he had, he was one of the original, um, instructors of that, uh, so department. Um, so they're the ones that kind of sort of dropping that hint. Um, and then you're just hearing stories of, of what they were telling me. I was like, that's pretty cool. Uh, that sounds awesome. And we had a uh, recruiter came down. We met at the movie theater, put on this pretty awesome video. I think I think they're still showing it. I mean, it's it's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, and and the thing with it is that recruiting video, the majority of it is Little Birds and Blackhawks, and then you see a little bit of Forty Seven, and they land in like a um, like a dune motor motorcycles come run out of it. Um, they're flying over a river with a boat, you know, sling loading a boat. That was enough for me to see and go, hmm, that's cool. And that Echo model is a big, sexy, you know what, and I want it. Uh, that, I've that, never that, heard that, anyone use the yeah. word sexy to describe it before. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got those nice big hips on it. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's a big, beautiful woman. <laughs> it's got some junk in its trunk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those guys kind of, and one of them, um, I was a, had gotten pressed up. I was a fairly new flight engineer. And so uh, there was two guys up there in the regiment. One, their last name ended in C, either Big Ski and Little Ski. So Little Ski came down, and he was the guy, and he actually got assigned to the same aircraft as me. Um, so we were both flight engineers, but I learned a lot more um, from him going out and doing some fun stuff. And because he had come from the regiment, when it came time to do some – Stuff that we hadn't been familiar with, you know, we're kind of like we'd expose to They're like, hey, you know, Charlie Company, you know, third of the seventh over there, they want to do, they want to do some repelling, and it's not something that people really do. So he's like, I did that. I've done fast trip, and I, shit, I got all that. So they even some of the old checklists that they had brought with them, you know, that had their their stuff in it. So you know, I got to go out and do, um, you know, do some uh, your repelling with them, which is not common at the time in the 47 world. Um, so when it came time that, you know, Panama was shutting down, they said, all right, you know, December of 1999, we're done. You know, they didn't renew the treaty. You're leaving. But for the 47 community, we're going to give you two options. Number one, you can move. And at the time we'd shrunk down. So we went from eight helicopters to six. So they said, you can either move with those helicopters to Sotocano, Honduras, and you can finish out 
your your term there. So if you had six months a year, whatever it was left on your your assignment, you'll finish it out. They said, or you can go back to wherever. You can do a dice, leave it up to a DA to see where they're going to cut your orders to. I said, well, I initially came down to Panama in two years, and uh, I loved it, but I signed up for two more, so I did four years. I said, I'm, I'm kind of kind of ready to go back to the States. And uh, I'd been up to Honduras a couple times, TDY. And I thought, yeah, it's a cool little place, but yeah, that sucks. So mm, I'm, I'm ready. Um, so the other guy that came from the regiment, the guy that came from Bravo Company, had been around for a long time, was very well respected, knew a lot of people. Um, I became pretty good friends with him um, and his family. So I was talking with him and I you know, said, hey, you know, what, what do you think? What do you think about me trying out, you know, assessing? Is I think it uh, I think it'd be a good fit. You got, a, you got the big personality for it. You're pretty laid back. You kind of roll with the punches. You're you know always eager to go out and do stuff, and you, know, you have a good passion for it. So, yeah, go for it. And then he asked me, he goes, but here's the big question: Where do you want to go? I said, uh, Do I have a choice? He goes, Well, yeah, uh, with me you do. <laughs> you know, you would you would kind of like do. It's not as formal. Um, you would fill out a packet, you'd send it in, you know, the enlisted recruiters take a look at it and go, yeah, you're in. I put on the enlisted side, I could show it up and be like, hey, cool, you're a, in fact, you're a fairly new E5, so you're going to take a squad and maintenance, you know, you're going to run a, a maintenance squad or something I'm like, nope, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I said, what, what's the difference? What's the difference between A company and B company? I mean, I know there's a difference between the two guys that I, I knew mentality wise. He goes, well, the easiest way to put it was A company works with the cool people. B company goes to all the cool locations. And I was like, well, um, what do you mean? He goes, well, if you want to go work with the, you know, the, the field guys out of Virginia Beach, or you want to go work with the Delta guys, you're going to have a good time, but you better get used to sleeping in tents and cots, and you're going to get very familiar with you know, the, the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona. I said, okay. What about the other one? He goes, well, if you want to work with the other company, and you'll get to work with the uh, you know the SF guys, and the Seals, maybe the Rangers on occasion, um, but you're going to stay in a very nice hotel on the beach in Virginia Beach. We go down to Destin, Fort Walden, and we love to stay at the Four Point Sheridan on the beach. When we go to Colorado, we stay in the hotels and condos. I was like, mm, yep. So they're still <laughs> cool people. You're going to have that exposure. I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So Bravo Company, that, that sounds like a good fit for me. So <laughs> I don't know who that guy knew. Uh, I don't know who I got later on who his, who his good friends were. But about a month later, I got that little, we call it a little candy gram, that little green purse gram. You know, you rip off the edge like an envelope, and it's like, congratulations, you're on assignment to Fort Camp, Kentucky. To the, the 160, I was like, wow. Um, so I didn't have to fill out a packet. I didn't have to interview, but you know, looking back, I think I kind of did that interview for about two years right. working with those guys in Panama. They they vouched for me and said, "Yeah, this is the dude you want." And so, showed up to Fort Campbell in uh, March, April ish of '99, um, and then you know, great platoon assessment, all that stuff, and off and running. So what was uh what what was that like assessment like? I mean, it sounds like there was some sort of like breaking in period. Oh yeah, they break you in pretty good, all right. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that is a that's the big difference between the officer and enlisted side of the house. Um, while the pilots go up, you know, the officers, you know, they get called up, they go to Fort Campbell, they go through their actual assessment, um, which later on in my regimental career, I actually kind of got to to take part in a couple of those, um, especially being, you know, joined there at the head uh, while uh, on the, you know, seven and uh, I don't know if I get in trouble for saying this, but I actually got involved in a board. Um, that was great. Um, but the assessment for the pilots and the officers, it, it's a pretty, I mean, man, I've seen some pretty big, badass dudes break down in tears because um, it's just emotionally, they're a wreck. For the and then they still go through. And if they get assessed, they get selected. They come up. They go through green platoon, but theirs is more of a gentleman's course. You know, they'll say that's pretty hard, but it's physically not really. Um, it's kind of a gentleman course. But their 
you know, their piece is the aircraft. It's right. the mission planning and the flight stuff. That's, that's where it matters. For us, we show up and we're with everybody. There, there's no difference. If you were an enlisted person going to the regiment, you're there. So we were talking you know, before we came on the show about, you know, the, the logistics guys, supply, maintenance, avionics, you know, the S1 passport. Everybody that's enlisted, you will go through Green Platoon. Um, you know, we've even had guys that show the regiment. Even the DAs. They're in Green Platoon with us. So Wait, when you show up, yeah. We, we missed that. You, you broke up again. Can you? Uh, we didn't hear who, who was there with you. Any, any enlisted MOS, the medics, personnel, you name it, you're all going through Green Platoon. Uh -huh. um, the senior enlisted guys, the E7s and a very few guys will show up unless they, they know somebody and they've kind of been handpicked. Um, you're all going through Green Platoon. So when you show up, you go out to, you know, at the time it was at the bunkers, out in Campbell's, you know, old Arksville base where they used to store the nukes. Um, depending on when you show up, you kind of, your assessment. We, we, Daniel, we completely lost that part of it. I'm really sorry. Yeah, I don't know what it is with the audio, but it's it's like you're underwater at certain points. Yeah. Ah, yeah, welcome, welcome to the lovely Orlando, uh, you know, AT and T. It's delightful. Um, but well, we'll try this again. So, uh, anybody and everybody, when you show up, you're you're called, you're in snowbird status. You're just doing, you're doing this work until it comes time for class. Um, when I showed up, uh, my claim to fame is I got to build the parking lot for the obstacle course. It was beautiful, nice. Very nice parking lot. <laughs> so I showed up and uh, got to Fort Campbell. You know, when you show up to Fort Campbell, you, you go through, you know, Big Army, 101st Airborne Division, replacement detachment. That was the that really reinforced the idea that I did not want to have any part of that. Right. <laughs> it was like, no, thank you. Um, but as an E5 showing up, you're, you just show up in the morning, you do PT and cut loose. There's no babysitting. That was the only good part about it. So I would show up, do PT, come back, sign in at like 9 o'clock, then I'd go do my appointments, and I'd go out to the compound. And I'd meet with my future workmates. Um, you know, one of my platoon sergeants was there. Some of the guys were gone at the time because uh, that's when uh, – oh, uh, uh, shit, what was it called? Um, that's when I had the no-fly zone stuff going on in Iraq. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In 99, 99. So um, that was my future unit. Um, my company. So there was a small skeleton crew there, um, but I got to know them guys, um, which was great. But where I got screwed was one of the guys called down to the schoolhouse and said, Hey, when does the next green platoon start? And I said, Oh, it starts on, uh, starts on Tuesday. Awesome. So Dan, meet me here. I'll take you down there on Monday. Follow me down there. I'll show you where it's at and we'll get you signed in. Great. So I showed up down there Monday around noon and I realized that something big mistake had happened. That was the officer green platoon that started on Tuesday. And the green platoon started that morning. So I got to spend about eight weeks as a snowbird, which looking back, hindsight 2020, ended up being probably the best thing that happened. Um, because then, you know, doing, you know, Night Stalker PT every morning, you know, getting very intimate with logs, telephone poles, you know, you, you even learn there's techniques to push Humvees. <laughs> so it's, uh, um, it, it helped me get ready. So that way when actual true assessment day showed up, man, it was, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was, it was much easier. Yeah. So for us, the actual assessment, even though you had orders and you were out of the compound doing your thing, it didn't mean that you were in. You still had to go through Green Platoon, and you had to pass that assessment to get into class. So we had, I don't know, maybe 60, 75 people that were there. And, um, you know, it didn't matter if you were an MOS that was needed or if you were picked. If you didn't pass the PT test, you didn't pass whatever they need you pass, well, you get recycled, and then you still didn't. And they could send you and pack you across the street. Welcome to the 101st. So we start off on a 50, 60, 70, a lot. And uh, 
when we finished, there was, I think, 40, 35 or 40 of us that were in the class. And then that's when, that's when the shit got real. Um, that's when suddenly you're, you had a couple like the, the junior night stalkers, you know, Sergeant Knight, the butcher, um, they were mean, but okay. Cause they, they didn't want to piss you off at the point you quit and left already, but they had a job to do. But that first day when you made it in, you realized real quick that, okay, these guys are serious. They got a job to do and they're going to do it really well. And it was, uh, it was four or four weeks that were pretty intense. And I, I want to move forward a little bit because you had a, a, a long career, um, and I want to make sure that we get to some of the uh, interesting deployments as well. Um, but, you know, of course, you, you made it into 160th. I uh, spent a little bit of time there. I mean, can you, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of your early years and the run-up to 9-11 and then sort of how that changed things for both for the unit and for you personally? Yeah, it was, um, man, it was a good time. Um you know, going to Bravo Company, I think, was a great decision. Um, it was a great place to be. Um, my very first trip was 100% exactly what that dude said. We went to Virginia Beach, and we stayed in a hotel right there on the beach, and it was awesome. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is heaven. This is where I want to be. I'm never going to leave this place. <laughs> um, so what I also learned real quick was you're going to be gone a lot, uh, especially if you're new because um, – you know, that's the fact of life of, you know, being a special operations community is, which we learned later on, is you never know. And kind of almost seems like we're learning that right now with some stuff going on. But you never know when the shit's going to, you know, the flag's going to go up and in pagers, cell phones are going to go off and it's time to get it on. Um, so you're very interested in getting you trained up real quick. So um, I showed up, got my physical everything done, ready to go. And I think within the first week of, being in the company, I had taken what's called a command cal. Um, you basically go out with uh, you know one of the instructor guys, and they're going to go out and do some traffic pattern stuff. You know, one of the pilots, one of the newer pilots, getting trained. Um, so we went out, and uh, the guy that actually gave me my commander's eval um, became a you know a person that dude I've been in Panama with became my first you know mentor in the regiment of that is the that's the face that's the poster boy of what it's like to be a crew member on a 47 in the regiment um and al mack knows him knew him very well he mentioned that his name was trey ponder um but he was his he ended up becoming al's 47 standards guy for the regiment he was the regimental 47 crew member and uh, he was subsequently um killed when that uh when the aircraft got shot down in uh, northern afghanistan looking for marcus luttrell when uh, when that got compromised, so uh, but amazing amazing guy. So we went out, you know, we did the commander's eval, and uh, he goes, hey, so you know, Mitch, the guy I was referring to earlier, he goes, hey, so he told me uh, you're, you're pretty smart. You know what you're doing? I said, oh, somebody set me up, ready to go. <laughs> he goes, all right, so you, know, you used to do rescue white stuff. And I said, yeah, we take the internal winch, rig up some pulleys, and drop it down through the center cargo hole. He goes, well, we have our own. So just go out here and just just make your calls. Just call it like you did when you were in Panama, you know, you know, dumping guys down in the, uh, the canal. I went out there and I did some rescue away stuff. He goes, man, that's, you're right. You, you did that pretty good. Um, we're going to change up some terminology, but you had it. And then uh, we went back and we did a couple of little things. And they said, yeah, you're going you're gonna to move up pretty quick. So I started going on every trip. Um, you know, with Virginia Beach, went down to uh, Hurlburt you know, down in Destin, Florida for some overwater ops and uh, refueling. And then while we were there, actually is where I did my first um, iteration of minigun training. So I had been trained up on the, the M60, you know, the big army got the M60 at the time. So suddenly I'm, you know, sitting here behind the, you know, the, the machine gun that's got six of them attached. <laughs> with six barrels. Um, so going through some epic training, um, minigun stuff and, um, you know, when did some overwork, you know, there were chem lights and bottles out in the ocean and, you know, got to shoot them up. So that was my first exposure to the minigun. And that's, that's when I fell madly in love. I was like, yeah, grew up with BB guns. And I don't know if that's my hand-eye coordination. I, you know, played baseball as a kid, but I always had a BB gun, um, always. So suddenly I was like, this, mm-hmm. this is pretty amazing. You know, um, 
you know, everybody in the regiment, when you first start shooting a minigun, you want to become Jesse the Body Ventura in Predator. Right. You know, you just want to hit that button and just let that shit rip and just start cutting down trees. Um, and then you really quickly realize that you are going to get smacked upside the head with a mag light real fast. Um, it's the best training aid. So started doing minigun training, headed down to uh, Florida, did some more down there, um, shooting on the range. Um, the cool thing that, remember, very funny from that, is that aircraft recovery exercise uh, with the Air Force guys. And um, that was kind of a really first glimpse of, you know, what a mission could be like. Um, Virginia was just going out and doing stuff here. Fast. It was okay, but we didn't really do mission scenarios that was for training. But that downed aircraft recovery training we did in Hurlburt to see really what some really cool stuff can do in PJs. I mean, it was like, you know, it was my first exposure to, you know, I'm living in a movie. Um, this is awesome. Uh, so, yeah, tons of training gone. You know, you're gone more at home. Um, and that didn't really change much. Uh, the only thing that changed was after the GWAT kicked off, um, we started kind of, you know, there, there became no difference flight companies. You know, A and B company wasn't us versus them. It was, we don't care. Everything's going to get done. Everything became standardized across the board. I'm a third battalion guy in Washington. One big thing. That was really the biggest thing pre GWAT was the massive amounts of training we did, a lot of it, even at home. And I've, I've told people, I said, you know, there's times I was home and I didn't see my wife and kids for three days yeah. in the same bed, but you know, she'd get up, take the kids out. I'd crash, wake up, leave, go to work, and she'd come home with the kids. Um, and then after GWAT, it just became, it was the same thing, but now you throw deployments, you know, every kind of in the middle of it. And in those early days, uh, you actually ended up in Panama, right? Or I'm sorry, in, in the Philippines. Pardon? Yeah, so um, the Air Force and their infinite wisdom decided that the um, the three were going to get retired. So they were going to retire the 53s, and they were going to replace the 53s with the Ospreys, the tilt rotor stuff. I don't know what politician who was greasing what palms, but suddenly they went, oh, maybe we jump the gun on retiring the 53s because the Ospreys are killing people and it's not a aircraft. So right. there was such a void in the PACOM, you know, Pacific Theater. So they decided they were going to chop a chunk of the regiment and take over the so, we, we, we lost so you again, Daniel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like it's something wrong with it's like some kind of reverberation on the audio. So I, I was going to ask you to like be close to the computer and try to speak directly into it. I think I think that will help a little bit. Yeah, let me uh, see if I can scoot some stuff around here. All right, how's that? Any better? Yeah, yeah. It's better for now. All right. So, yeah, so Korea, we moved um, 647s to um, Korea to take over that 53 mission, you know, when they were retiring the 53s and replacing them. Um, so they came out and they put a, a sign on the board in the office one day, and this was Bravo Company was going to do the main slice of that. And uh, they said, hey, here's the deal. You know, we're going to go to Korea. It's going to be a one-year deal, and it's, you know, you're going to come right back. Um, it's not like, you know, big arm, you're going to go there and then who knows where you're going to end up. So, um, yeah, there's a few of us and I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. I, I enjoyed Panama and, you know, we're staying with the, it's, you know, not a, you know, we're not changing units. We're just building one and moving it. So I put my name on the list and, uh, you know, as one of the, I don't know, however many, they went down and drew the line and said, all right, anybody above this line, you're going. So that was it was one of the most painful experiences. One of the most fun experiences was before we left, um, we broke out. We, we moved out of our office in the Bravo company office. And we literally moved into a trailer um, in the parking lot, like a single wide. <laughs> they parked it in the parking lot. Half of it was the maintenance and shops guys. The other half of the flight platoon. But that became such a good time because we had such a small group of people that we became very, very close. Um, still very good friends. Um, to many of them this day. So we left. Um, we trained up for almost um, about a year um, as a group, you know, from, and we took people from a little bit of both. Some A company guys, even some third battalion guys came up and joined us. So we moved to, 
We moved to Korea in June of 2001. So we thought this is going to be the best year ever. We're going to go on the big trainings to the Philippines and to Japan, you know, all, you know, Thailand, balance piston, all right, those right. big fancy exercises. Um, they shipped all the aircraft over. Um, you know, when we got there, our barracks weren't even ready. So we had to build our own beds. We had to put our furniture together. So the first couple weeks was painful, but once we got it, now we started flying our ass off because um, we still had to understand all the flight rules there. So you've heard Al talking about having to fly the, the no fly line up in you know the border, the, the DMV. So we had to do the same thing. Um, we had to go up there. We had to learn the rings, you know, the rings around Seoul, the, the no fly zone. Um, and, and you had to be able to fly it and navigate it without a map. So um, being one of the first guys over there, I was one of the first guys that got qualified because we brought two aircraft over at a time. So we brought two over a couple weeks later, two, a couple weeks later, more. Um, so being one of the initial guys, I was one of the first people to get qualified on it. So when you're taking the new people, you have to have a qualified crew to train the non-qualified crew, you know, in case something goes on. So we did that. And then, of course, 9-11 kicked off. Um, that's a whole nother story in itself. I had the fortunate pleasure of being on staff duty that night. That was crazy. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but, yeah, so suddenly 9-11 kicks off. And, you know, we know that our guys back home are hitting the road, hitting it fast. You know, Bravo Company's going up north. Alpha Company's going out on the Kitty Hawk. And then here we are, Echo Company, um, you know, sitting on the rock. Um, there was a lot of rumors um, where we were going to go, but it kind of squashed. Uh, we did a, a TDY to Japan um, that November. But then the Philippines turned into something. Um, so... January of 2002, they decided that they were going to continue on with what was the normal annual, you know, balance piston training exercise. Um, we had, I can't remember what group it was, but um, we had the guys out of Guam um, that came down. So they kind of changed things around a little bit. They said, you know, this is not really a TDY. This is more of a train up because we're going to go down. We're going to train up with the real guys that we're going to work with, and then we're going to move south, you know, further down into the, the southern Philippines because we got some stuff we're going to do. So they changed around the crews, um, the assigned crews, and one of those guys that was supposed to go originally was me. Um, so they pulled me, and one of the crew chiefs on my airplane, they pulled us off, and then uh, the other guys, Kerry Frith and uh, Bruce Rushforth, my, my senior flight engineer on the plane, and then um, one of the other crew chiefs, they went with it. So we got to stay back home and watch our airplane fly away. Fast forward a month, they're doing their training stuff. They moved down from the northern Philippines down to the island of Cebu, which is about halfway. Um, it's the halfway point down the Philippine Islands. Big, you know, it's called MACTAN Air Base. So from there, they were launching the flights down around the Philippine Sea all the way down south to a little place called Zambawanga, Philippines. There was the main base camp. That's where we had everything based out of, the supply, the refuel stuff. We would fly in there, C-130s would roll in, they would dump off the group guys. We would pick them up and then fly. We basically had to fly out over the ocean, do our test fires, do anything with, we need to do something like that, and then come back. And then we dropped them off on uh, a little bitty island called Basilan, Basilan Island. If you look at it, it, looks like a little head with two ears sticking off the side of it. Um, but the uh, the problem was is it's a long flight. So when you would leave Cebu, you had to in-flight refuel on the way down. You would land, pick up your guys, dump them off, do your thing. A lot of sling loads, which in the in the regiment, a sling load to us is a boat, Humvees, you know, shotgun Humvees or something. You, you never did, like, you know, we're going to sling load cargo nets and we're going to sling load connexes. That's big army stuff. That, that's not what we do. That's what we were doing um, because you're sling loading some stuff for the, uh, the SF guys onto an island with a whole bunch of bad terrorist guys in the middle of the night where it's, you know, asshole dark. Um, so it turned out to be pretty, pretty sporty stuff. But unfortunately, on one of those trips um, on the way home, our Chalk 2 aircraft was transferring, was crossing over. The weather deteriorated. Um, you know, it was hard to tell horizons. Guys were getting tired. They'd been flying a long time, and they went to do a crossover. And in the process of doing so, the uh, trail aircraft um, burned in. So it nosed over. 
because at the time, and that was a, a big thing that changed in the regiment because of that incident was we used to fly a hundred feet, you know, a hundred feet over the water, you know, 110, 20, 130 knots, whatever you want to do over the water, your reaction time, you, you don't have much. I mean, by the time you see, you know, your, your anti-collision light flashing off the water, by the time you reach up, grab your button, scream into it, climb, 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 too late. And, uh, and that's what happened to them. So they got disoriented during the crossover maneuver. I mean, it's very simple maneuver, but kind of complicated if, if things go wrong. And uh, they overflew a little bit, got got a little discord, you know, uncoordinated, dropped back, and then went to accelerate and just, you know, nosed it in. So we lost. Uh, and because of a passenger swap that they did when they got down to the uh, down to um, Zamboanga, at the time they had the um, the sock pack. Um, commander, Brigadier General Worcester, you know, lovely guy. Now that I'm retired, not a fan, but um, he wanted to ride along, you know. So they put him in the jump seat of the lead aircraft, which caused our air mission commander, who was Major Kurt Feisner, to ride in chalk two. So when they got back, landed, kicked everybody off, he just said, hey, I'll just stay here. We're just on the way home, you know, just get us home. So when we lost um, Wild 4-2 was the call sign, we lost our platoon leader, our company commander, um, the most senior flight engineer in the company, Kerry Frith, who is my senior epi on my airplane. Um, but total, we lost 10 guys. Um, we also lost two uh, Air Force PJs that were riding along as well. So that was that was my first experience of, oh, shit, this is real. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, up until then, you know, we had, um, in, in the 47 world, I'd never experienced anything, you know, I'd, I've heard of it. You know, there was other people out there that had incidents, but it, and it was never, you know, I was like, man, that, that sucks. It was never, it never touched me. Um, and then all of a sudden, my airplane with two of my crew members just, you know, crashed and killed everybody on board. And uh, we found out because we were watching the news that morning waking up. Um who another person, another delightful little person that uh, I have no shame in putting her name out there. Um, Cynthia Terramay was the PAO, uh, the public affairs officer. She had an uncanny way of having news crews waiting in the LZ while we were landing. <laughs> so that was, that was fun. Um, but yeah, we were waking up for a PT that morning and, uh, you know, back of the house and, um, you know, good old AFN, you know, you had like three stations. So, all of a sudden you start hearing the doors and the hallways open up and people banging on doors. Um, you know, in Korea, we didn't have pagers. We had some, you know, little, those little Nokia cell phones and you start hearing the cell phones going off and, uh, somebody's banging on my door. It's like, Hey, wake up, man. It's again, I'm awake. What's up? And he goes, turn on the news. And on the news, you know, like Fox news or whatever, CNN has got the little ticker at the bottom and it says U S army helicopter crashes in the Philippines kills 10. Well, there's only one helicopter the U.S. has that carries that many, and that's us. So yeah. um, very quickly, we got the word, you know, go to the hangar. You know, put on your put on your uniforms, go to the hangar. And uh, we got there. We still didn't know details, um, but we get there. We're in the hangar standing around. And another um, Panama buddy of mine, um, who was a pilot that also went to the regiment, was in Echo Company with us. Um, he comes to get me. He goes, hey, Dan, I need to, I need to talk to you real quick. I was like, yeah, man, what's, what's going on? So he pulls me into one of the little side offices and he goes, hey, um, I just want you to be the first to know that it was yours. We lost your airplane. And I was, I mean, I just, I buckled. Um, it was just absolutely most horrible experience. Um, so we sat there for a few minutes, kind of got my my wits about me. And uh, he goes, hey, you want to, do you want to go out and, and tell everybody? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll break the news. So we walked out, and um, as soon as I walked out, I think everybody realized what what happened because I was, you know, not in a good way. So we met up, everybody had them circle around, and we we broke the news to them. Um, We had a great memorial. Um, You know, that night, everybody just got absolutely obliterated, shit-faced, had a bonfire. Because the way our barracks were in Korea, we had three buildings with a hooch in the middle, and that was the bar. You know, the Air Force ran the bar. It was, you know, everybody paid for the alcohol out of pocket with our ration cards. So we just got absolutely obliterated. Um, but the, the awesome thing was in Korea, we were like celebrities in Korea, especially cause we were down in the South. We we're 
in South Korea, but way down south in Taegu, where there was, you know, it was all support stuff, you know, this contingency. And all of a sudden, here comes the special operations guy. They literally had the red carpet rolled out for us when we, when we walked off the airplanes. Uh, it was pretty awesome. But when that happened, um, everybody, I mean, everybody came out in massive support. Because um, even at that time, you know, Afghanistan was going on. They had suffered some losses, but um, suddenly they went, wait, you mean there's something else besides Afghanistan going on? Right. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. sure. So we had a memorial um, there. Um, I was going to do a eulogy for one of the other guys uh, that was there. Uh, but then they called and said, hey, we have to replace that crew. Well, you know, we're, we're still in the game. We got to go. So um, I said, well, I'm, I'm going. So they took three of us, um, stuck us on a bus. <laughs> we took a bus from Tegu, Korea, up north to Osan Air Base. And then we took a medical, like a med- medevac, Air Force medevac 727 or something from Osan Air Base to Okinawa, Japan. And that was my really first experience of how stupid the military can be sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> we're deploying, you know, in, in our world, we're deploying to war. I mean, cause we're, we're down there. We're, you know, uh, the big thing in the Philippines was, yeah, there's the Abu Sayyaf group. It's super duper, very, you know, it's a hot spot, but they also had two American hostages and yeah, the, the Philippine Burnham's. nurse. They had Martin. Um, so Martin and Gracia Burnham were missionaries from Kansas. And that was kind of one of the, one of the underlying things was we're trying to find them. So when we deploy, we're, I mean, we got our M4s, nine mils, we got our heaps, our, our breathing, our bi- oxygen bottles that we carried with it in case we did have to ditch. So we've got all this stuff that suddenly this flight crew goes, you can't bring that on this airplane. And I went, well, we're deploying to the Philippines for combat operations. And they said, well, this is a medevac flight. You can't bring guns on here. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay, wh- what do we do? So luckily we were able to talk to the, uh, the flight crew and said, look, you know, what if we tear these guns down? So we, we took our M4s, we took all the bolts out and we put them in a Ziploc bag and the pilot kept them in the cockpit. We took the lower receivers, stuffed them in a check baggage and put them in the cargo hold. We took the upper receivers and put them in our carry on bags upstairs with us. Yeah. And it didn't stop there. We get to open now. <laughs> We land, we meet up with our flight doc. We had a civilian flight surgeon that also worked with us. So he had already been forward stage to Okinawa to receive some of the bodies. Um, Because the night of the crash, they actually recovered three. Uh, They recovered three bodies on site from that that incident. So he was receiving the bodies and getting ready to do all the transfer stuff. So he met us up, met up with us. We went back to the hotel that he had there on base. Took about a two-hour nap. And then we had to get up and meet up with an Air Force C-130 along with a whole bunch of Air Force people because they were, were all going to Cebu for the memorial service. So we've got the 320th STS guys, the Special Tactics Squadron, some, you know, bunch of VIP dignitaries that are going. And then we had to go through security. So there was no difference of us trying to get on that air threat, that to get on that C-130 than it was when my wife and I just flew to Chicago last weekend going through TSA. It's Welcome ridiculous. to the Air Force. Yes, yeah, ridiculous. So, basically the same thing. I mean, they, you, like even our little heat bottles, our oxygen bottles, it's empty. There's nothing in it. It's just a cylinder with a you know, like a breathing device, but it's not charged. There's nothing in it. We got our weapons, everything. So, luckily, while we're sitting there and we're about ready to start fighting with some Air Force security people because I'm carrying the guide on. You know, we just lost our commander, platoon leader. We are not in a good place. Luckily... One of the C-130 crew chiefs sees this going on and comes over and says, hey, grab all your stuff. Come with me. So they sneak us out the front door, around the side, stuff us in a van, smuggle us out on the flight line, and then we get on the C-130 and go. I was like, this is just absolutely fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we got to the Philippines. Um, when we got there, they were literally waiting on us. Um, the formation was there, the Air Force guys, the Army dudes. We get off put the guide on together, pass it off to our, you know, our, our new, you know, acting commander. And uh, we did the memorial service right then and there. I mean, 10 minutes after walking off the C-130, we were all, oh, we were man. all there. And then, you know, the next day we were front page Army Times. You know, I mean, right there was a picture of a bunch of, you know, Army and Air Force dudes crying at the memorial service with, you know, 
you know, 10 service people lost. Well, I, and, I uh, mean, we one, uh, one day and then we went right back out and started flying missions two days later. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to just want to say thank you for telling that story, Daniel, because it's uh, one of these things that I feel really got lost in the news with everything else that was going on after 9 11 uh, and the wars. That this is something that I, I feel like just kind of n- not intentionally, there's no malice behind it, but it just got forgotten. It got buried by all the other news. And um, I'm really glad to hear you, you know, tell the story and, and talk about your buddies and your teammates a little bit uh, and, and kind of keep that memory alive. Um, because, I mean, it's I, I just think it's a shame that, you know, uh, it kind of got forgotten about by yeah. a lot of people. Unless you're from a very small, specific community that you come from, I, I feel like it got forgotten about. Yeah. And um, and that was that was kind of a sore, touchy thing. You know, we got back. Um, it, which the Philippines ended up going all the way up through, I think, July or August um, of that year. Um, I mean, even after I got there, I spent almost four months there. So it was a it was a nonstop thing, and we were flying every night. Um, we had no off time. We had three crews, and we only flew two crews a night. But every night, you know, you're taking off, you're going out. Um, and because the island was only it was five minutes away, it's like I said, we'd have to fly out to the ocean, do the test fires, make sure the guns are working before we could even come back inland. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, you know, four months of nonstop. Um, you know, the whole hostage situation got taken care of. Um, we got spun up for it, but um, it happened so quick and by accident that before we could even get there, it was already done. Um, so that was done. And then um, we got a hit on um, Abu Sabaya, who was the, uh, the terrorist leader down there. Mm-hmm. He's um, a spokesman. That is quite... <laughs> that's a whole funny story in itself, um, how that shit went down. Um, so they launched us, you know, they, they caught one of his, his <laughs> in Afghanistan, you know, Bin Laden, everybody had the driver. Well, he had a driver too, but he drove a super canoe. It was a, like a 20 foot long canoe with a big engine on the back. And that's how they were transporting them around the Island. So we had, we had kind of messed around a little bit with the, instead of a vehicle interdiction, there was a vessel interdiction yep. that, they tagged the boat with a little IR strobe and then we were going to go, you know, interdict the boat. <laughs> but um, it was kind of cool because we had, you know, we had a, a SEAL team that was there, special boat unit guys um, that were down there with us. Um, super good dudes. One of them actually ended up being a, a pilot um, in the regiment. Um, I don't know if you guys have interviewed him. Uh, Mike Rutledge. Um, he's know the, the guy. Know the name, he but... reported um, yeah, as the, uh, as the commander up there at, at West Point, the flight detachment. Awesome dude. Um, so that night they found that dude, they tracked his boat. Um, we had a, uh, we had a fixed wing asset that was there with us that was doing, um, overhead, you know, um, C2 stuff. So they launched us in the back. We had, uh, we had a couple field teams with two Zodiacs and then on the water, they had a huge, massive wooden boat that had five outboard engines on the back with a platoon of Filipino Marines. Yep. And then, like, seals as liaisons. The guy in the front of the boat is wearing goggles. The driver was not. And they were communicating from the front of the boat to the back via radio of, you know, turn left, turn right, slow down. We're orbiting and then, you know, waiting for the call because it was, you know, it took, you know, spec death, presidential approval, something like that to get this thing approved because we weren't allowed to be in combat operations. We were in a training role. So finally, we hear over the SATCOM. And uh, it was like, you know, sec def approved the, the whatever, you know, go, go, go. So we roll out. We go out. We extend. We roll out. And as we're setting up to come in to do the infill, that damn wooden boat ran right over the top of that canoe. And it turned into literally shooting ducks in a barrel. Um, the video of that is absolutely amazing. But that big wooden boat landed right on top of it. The four or five guys in the boat bailed out. And then these Filipino Marines just went to town, um, just launching – Everything they could shoot, they were launching, you know, two or three rounds into the water from 10 feet away. And we're just watching this shit from about a half mile, quarter mile out. Like, what the hell? And you hear me screaming on the radios. So what our mission ended up being that night was about two hours of flying overhead with a searchlight so they could pluck out the bodies I... and find. But Olympic, Olympic-style Olympic swimming took place that night. There were some dudes <laughs> that swam a half mile minutes trying to get to land. So we'd fly out. We'd hit our white light hover over the top of them you know, try to not drown them, but you know, get them to stop. And then the boats come over and pick them up. I have, I have, 
over the years, I have probably heard three to five different stories about how Abu Zabaya died. Um, what, one of my favorites is how he gets knocked off the boat. And apparently he was in full kit with a Kalashnikov treading water while firing on the Filipino Marines, leaving them with no choice but return fire. And his kit dragged him down to Davy Jones' locker. Was he riding a narwhal at the time? There are some questions that that's just between Abu Sabaya and God. Yeah. Um, but he did not make it through that. And then and then there's the whole story about how the Filipinos got Abu Sabaya's 1911 and it was a war trophy. And I'm trying to think he was in the water, treading water, shooting at you. You shot him. He sank. That, uh, how, where where'd this gun come from? It's between Abu Sabaya and God at this it, point. It was, I don't. It, it was obviously the buoyancy compensator device he there, had on his AK. <laughs> there are some interesting questions about some of that. Um, yeah. um, but in, in, if, if any of our listeners are interested in hearing the uh, actually the CIA uh, side of the story, uh, we've interviewed uh, Kent Clisby and Ron Moeller, who are both out there. Um, might be interesting just to go and hear hear that. Um, I think I think they and maybe you know Daniel. Did the agency have a drone up that night? Uh, there was a fixed wing asset in the air that night. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, who it belonged to and its purpose and owners? Don't know. That's also between <laughs> Abu Sabaya and God. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But yeah, um, he did not make it uh he didn't make it that fish night. food darn it yeah sorry for his loss yeah, yeah. thoughts and prayers yeah. yeah once uh yeah once he was no longer with us and then uh martin and gracia burnham um you know in that rescue attempt um martin um died in the attempt yeah um, and the best reports that we read out there was um he was shot in the back um, while laying on top and protecting his wife um but as we were spooling up to take off the, uh, and at that time, they had brought in some Air Force um, HH-60s to take over some CSAR role. Because up in that point in time, it was <laughs> it was the three of us, and then we'd get a P-3 Orion that would come out of Okinawa or out of Cebu and a C-130 tanker. That was it. And, of course, our little fixed-wing buddy. Um, but, yeah, there was nothing like, oh, shit, what happens if we lose another one? You know. So they brought those guys down, and uh, as we were spooling up to take off, uh, that's when the, uh, the, as we call them, the tail draggers, um, they landed and offloaded the uh, casualties in uh, Gracia, Gracia Burnham. Yes. So I actually, I actually, have, know that I actually have pictures of that from uh, from Kent. I mean, it's it's wild. And, I mean, that was a huge thing yeah. at the time. And there's uh, it was when we were spinning up the Light Reaction Regiment. It was probably a Light Reaction Battalion at that time, uh, the Filipinos, and a lot of consternation about – where Americans are allowed to be on yeah. some of these operations. Yeah. Yeah. I remember there was a big, a big stink um, because, you know, that little Island we were flying out to Barcelon, um, there was a, you know, even on our maps in our planning center on the, the Southeast corner, there's like a little, you know, like a, a quarter of it that's in that corner with big yellow hash marks. that says like, you know, do not go here where even the Filipino military and the Filipino aircraft were like, you don't go there. That, that's like an off-limits place. You go in there on that south side. It was a pretty steep incline to some pretty good islands. And uh, I remember we were going in the planning center one day for our, our mission brief. And our uh, flight lead at the time, um, he looks up and he goes, hey, you know that spot? We're going there. And we're like, oh, that's great. And we're uh, and we're sling loading some supplies to the uh, the base camp there, the SF guys and stuff that are in there. So we're like, this sucks. Um, so we always went with two. Uh, we had the third aircraft that was always on standby on the island um, or up on the uh, the main base. And then when we would go in, we would have one aircraft that would go in and the other one would perform a cap, you know, overhead, you know, with, you know, guns ready to go. So in case something happened. But, yeah, that was um, that was some pretty good pucker factor right there, knowing that you're <laughs> going into this little valley of death where even the Filipinos say you don't go there. Yeah. And I'm carrying a. a you know, fuel bladders, you know, 55 gallon drums of fuel on the, on it, razor wire. And we're just chucking right along at, you know, five, 10 knots. You know, we're like, Oh man, we can, we're going to take a shot right up the ass for this one. So we got in as soon as that thing, you know, I'm, and a lot of it, I was doing the, the sling load calls. So I'm laying on the, on the floor staring, you know, hanging out that hole, looking down with my goggles on. And as soon as I saw the least bit of slack in those slings, 
I didn't wait for a call. I didn't wait for the pilot. I hit that button, opened that hook, and it's like, you know, loads released, clear to reposition, let's go. And they <laughs> ripped the guts, and off we went. And then we'd perform the cap, and then Chalk 2 would come in and do the same thing. So yeah, what, what, after uh, after the Philippines, you did 11 deployments to Afghanistan. And, and so now, now you're real, where the special operations community in general is getting into that rotation of that schedule going back and forth. Um, and can you tell us about, you know, that experience for you from your perspective? Yeah. So, um, you know, originally we went to Korea, we were going to go right back to where we came from. You know, so you leave Bravo, come, you go to Korea, you're coming right back. But uh, after we lost, um, you know, wild four, two, um, there was suddenly a, a big void, you know, we're down one helicopter and we just lost, and um, we lost five crew members. We had a fifth guy that we usually don't have, but they put a fifth guy on there to help with all the cargo stuff. You know, so we keep all four sets of eyes outside, one guy in the hole. So I was approached and said, hey, would you mind extending for six months? Get us get us through this. We need an old timer. You know, at the time, consider an old timer. been in Korea. So, like, you know, would you mind staying for six months? I said, sure. But can I go home? I want to go home on leave. I need, to, I need to go. You know, my wife, I had just met her two months. You know, I met her in April of 02 and I, I left for Korea in June because we weren't supposed to go to Korea until later that year. We we're actually on a TDY trip out in North Carolina and they said, Hey, uh, we got a quick little meeting. Um, I need you and you and you, you're going home like first thing tomorrow because they just accelerated the timeline. It's not six months, 60 days. So I was like, Oh shit. Okay. So I said, can I, can I at least go home, take some leave, you know, clear my head. I gotta, I gotta get through this stuff. So, um, they said, yeah, go home, you know, how much leave you got saved up? I said, I got a lot a good. Take 30 days, take 30 days, go home, have a good time, come back and then we'll, uh, we'll finish it up. So, um, so when I came home, um, around July, I guess, July, August of 2002, you know, by then we'd almost been at a year of, of going to town and, and doing business in Afghanistan where, you know, all my buddies that I'd left previously that were doing that. So, um, yeah, even talking to some guys there, I said, yeah, you know, it was great. I spent four months in the Philippines. And some of the guys were like, what were you doing there? <laughs> like, hmm, what? I said, yeah, that's, you know, OEF, OEFP, OEF, Operation During Freedom Philippines. It's a thing. And, uh, oh, is that where we lost? That's where we lost, uh, that, that's where we lost the aircraft, right? And that's kind of going back to what you were saying earlier. Is even at that time, you know, even some of our own people didn't really fully understand what's going on. So, um, had a great time. Um, we had a family reunion down here in Orlando, Florida. Um, at a, at a resort. Um, so my girlfriend picked me up and I said, Hey, uh, you want to go to Orlando for the week and hang out and meet the family? She's like, sure. So we came down here, uh, and had a great time. Had such a great time that the day that I'm flying back to Korea, you know, there's little tears going on. I'm getting ready to go back. Now war's going on. It's become real for me. It's become real for her. So, you know, the emotions are going high and, uh, so like, I don't know, it's like two o'clock in the morning or something. She says, Hey, I, I really got something I need to tell you. I said, sure. What's going on? She goes, uh, I'm pregnant. I was like, eh, great, whatever. Going back to sleep. <laughs> it was like, what did you just say? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that family reunion, um, we, we started our own. So I called my, my buddy back in uh, Korea who actually my roommate in Korea at the time was the guy that introduced me to my wife. Um, he was dating one of her sort of kind of friends at the time. So I called back and said, Hey, you know, uh, I got a little family thing that popped up and he hung up the phone before I could say anything. He hung up the phone, ran across to the hooch. We're up on the third floor of the barracks, ran down again, Olympic sprinter hurdler. 10 minutes later, I've got about 20 people in my barracks room and my acting platoon sergeant at the time, who was in between because they're rotating through, oh, okay. real calm. He's like, "Hey Dan, what's going on? What can I? What do you need? You know, what's what? What do you need from us?" I said, "No, man, nobody's dead." I said, "We're <laughs> what?" He goes, "Man, Gerald came running in. He's freaking out. Like Dan's on the phone. We gotta go. He's got a family problem." I said, "No, man, a family situation has popped up. I can't just leave because <laughs> she had just recently gotten out of the Air Force. She was living at home." Um, with her parents, you know, get ready to start school and stuff. So I'm like, man, her parents barely even know who this guy is other than some army dude that just, you know, knocked up his daughter. I can't leave her here. So um, they said, yeah, take a couple more days. So the next day, you know, I think it might have been later day, we, we broke the news to their parents and we're like, hey, 
congratulations, grandma, grandpa. But I went back to Korea and then I ended up doing another year. So to kind of segue into life back at the house, um, <laughs> we were married with a four month old. We've been married like a year and a half with a four month old before we ever actually lived together. Yeah. Yeah. My little one year stint in Korea ended up turning into two and a half because at that time, you know, after the six months, they said, Hey, we want to send you back. And you know, we'd like to stay, you know, if you could stay another year, you know, you're here, you're a senior dude, you know, you're moving up the flight side of the house. So we, we want to send you to FI school if you'll do another year. That's that course of record. I said, oh man, I said, she's going to kill me for this. So I said, all right. I said, however, got another drug deal for you. I got to go home and make things right. I got to fix this problem, not fix a problem. That sounds, God damn, that sounded pretty bad. <laughs> but yeah, I need to fix this and make right. it right. So they said, all right, go home. So I said, all right, I'm going to, because the previous Christmas I stayed, you know, we're, we're in Korea for a year. I'm like, I'll stay here for Christmas. You guys go home and have families. At the time, I'm just a single dude with a girlfriend. So <clears throat> I got to go home. I went home at Christmas time. Um, we woke up one morning and said, hey, what do you want to do today? There's still, there's still conversation on how that worked out. But basically the conversation was, what do you want to do today? I said, well, let's go get married. So we did. Uh, we went and got married. Um, the justice of the peace was busy. So we met a family friend whose dad was a preacher who also worked at the Toyota dealership in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. So we called her parents and her best friend and her husband said, meet us at the dealership at 8 o'clock. And they're all like, why are you buying a car? I said, nah, something like that. You show up. So we literally got married on the showroom floor of the Toyota dealership in Hopkinsville, <laughs> Kentucky, with a little rebate sign behind it, you know, called to get your rebate. Um, yeah, and then I went back to Korea, and then I came home again in April when my son was born, got to spend three weeks with him, went back to Korea, came home a few months later for the FI course, uh, stayed with me at Fort Rucker for uh, a month and a half, and I went back to Korea, finished it off, and then I came home. Got home in December of 03. Signed in after leave in January. And in April, I was on my first deployment to Afghanistan. They're like, we'll give you 60 days. You're on the first C-17 out of here. Yep. Welcome to regiment and combat life. I was yeah. like, oh boy. Hardcore. Up. Hang on. So yeah, Korea Korea was a great time. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I look back at it, that it, it worked out um, pretty well. And then regiment kicked off. And then it was just go, go, go. And so what was it like running uh, operations, you know, and now, now as flight engineer in Afghanistan with 160th? Um, yeah, crazy. Um, crazy but awesome. Um, so by the time I got to uh, – and, and because I did that two-and-a-half-year thing, I was supposed to originally go back to Bravo Company. I didn't. I went to Alpha Company. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, here we go. Well, I'm going to go hang out with these prima donna guys. Um, but it was cool because by that time, um, Trey Ponder, who was, you know, really leading at the time, at that time he was the battalion standard guy. So he had come over to Korea, and we kind of helped work on this thing for a little bit, and it was called the 47 Delta Echo Non-Rated Crew Member SOP. So it took the Delta model guys from 3rd Battalion to Echo model guys from Alpha and Bravo Company and standardized everything across the board. So it wasn't, oh, we use green chem lights. Oh, well, we use red chem lights. We mm -hmm. use blue. It was, we don't care who you are, what you are, what company you're in. You're using this. You're going to say it this way. Because now Echo Company became the melting pot. So suddenly we're getting people there going, and that second year when that second rotation of people started showing up, it was ugly. There was almost fights um, on the aircraft, in flight, in the office. Well, this is how we did it in Echo Company. This is how we do it in Alpha Company. This is how we do it in Bravo Company. And then at the time, some of us who stayed were still pretty emotional about losing that airplane in February. So um, we're like, look, this is why we do things. We're not going to lose another one. And, then, you know, of course, right after we lost uh, Wild 4-2 in February, March, you know, two weeks later, we're actually sitting in the planning area in the Philippines getting ready to do a mission when they walked in and said, hey, we need to tell everybody that there's been an incident in Afghanistan and we currently have, um, you know, one bird is shot down. Another one or two are limping back to home, which turned out that was Anaconda. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, we lost, uh, we lost a gunner. We lost Phil Fetak, a crew chief on that one as well. So the tempers were flaring, you know, emotions are pretty high, but going to alpha company, um, it was actually pretty cool. Um, the guys there, since I had known some of them, um, and I was smart enough to sit back and bite my tongue and go, Hey, this is my first trip to Afghanistan. Some of these guys are already on their third and fourth. So this is not the time for me to say, Hey, I'm more senior to you. I have more flight hours than you. It's sit down, shut up, watch what's going on, soak it up, be the sponge and, and learn what it's like to fly combat missions in Afghanistan. Cause it's not the same as flying combat missions in the Philippines. <clears throat> So, um, and the Philippines was very quiet. I mean, it was stressful. You know, you didn't know. And we used to fly around and throw fruit and stuff out the windows just to try to get somebody to shoot at us because we were bored. Um, But suddenly in Afghanistan, my very first mission there, we flew down from Bagram down to the, we flew down to Kandahar, picked up guys, and we headed west. And um, that very first mission, we took fire. Uh, We didn't hit hit anything. Our aircraft right in front of us took a couple rounds. But that was suddenly like, whoa, <laughs> this is different. It really, did. yeah. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever seen that before. Interesting, <clears throat> you know. It doesn't doesn't look like it does in the movies. I, I want to ask you about uh, because one about the one sixtieth transition into Afghanistan, and then about yours because for people who don't know, Afghanistan, like the Chinooks, American helicopters were not really made to fly in a place like Afghanistan, especially during the summer when there's not as much density of the air, you're flying at altitude. How did, how did the 160th like adapt to that? And then for you, what were some of the lessons that you learned when you, when, during your first deployment there? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, and we've done high altitude training. Um, We used to go out to Colorado and Mm -hmm. fly up in the mountains. Um, We would fly out, um, we'd go east into the, uh, you know, the Smoky Mountains, and we'd do uh, radar, you know, multi-mode radar stuff. Um, and I used to tell people, I said, there's two times when it's okay to throw up on an aircraft. One is when you're doing in-flight refueling, and one is when you're doing MMR flights, multi-mode radars. Because it's just, it's just bouncy, the pilots are flying stuff, and it just gets, air sickness kind of gets a hold of you. So one of the great things that I loved about regiment was the way you trained at home was real life no shit this is the way it goes i mean aside from little you know you know when you're flying around fort campbell kentucky there aren't people shooting at you so you take that but the mission stuff we we literally did train like you fight so in afghanistan you know the the pilots are absolutely amazing i mean it's i still be glad i said i'd rather take i'd take the worst regimental 47 pilot over the best big army pilot any day um just because that level of training those guys go through so there was always a comfort to know that I've, I've literally got the best up front. You know, if something happens, I'm, I'm happy with that. So for the backside, um, a lot of it was really learning how to, to see and breathe while landing in talcum powder. Mm-hmm. Um, the, that was the biggest shock to me was the first time we came into an LED and I was like, what in God's name is this stuff? Um, the closest I've ever come to it is out, out in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. We found a little slice of heaven out there uh, that kind of became a second home to me for a while um, that had the closest uh, consistency, you know, the grit. But that Afghanistan dirt is something special. Mm. Um, the powder it makes when you hit it. Yeah. So, you know, you've heard, if you've ever had any pilot, and, and you guys flying in the back of them know that when you come in, that brownout condition, there's only one person. There's only one person that can see the ground. And it's maybe about a five to 10 foot diameter piece of ground. And that's me. That's whoever the guy is that's standing at the front right cabin door, the gunner. Um, so, you know, the pilot's got the FLIR, you know, so it kind of helps you a little bit. But even when the dust hits that, you can't see. So, you know, I'm hanging out, you know, leaning over the gun arm, you know, got my left arm up on the minigun, my right arm is hanging up on the, the strut for the hoist, and I'm looking straight down, and you see this little piece of dirt, you know, this big, and one thing I, I and it, it just occurred to me one day on a mission, and this was not, it was maybe a couple deployments into it, 
I think it was maybe second or third deployment, we had an imagery guy. And he looks up and he goes, hey, whoever's on, and I think it was like chalk two or three at the time, whatever airplane I was on, he goes, hey, when you come in, you're going to cross three walls before you can land. And I remember hearing that. So we're coming in, you know, we're calling the dust, you know, dust of the rotor blade, you know, probe tip, rotor blade, nose, poof, we're in it. And I remember looking straight down going one wall, two walls, three walls, you're clear down left and right. Yeah. And as soon as we passed that wall, they slammed it down. I look up, that settles, and, you know, 47, the probe tip is actually four feet under, you know, inside the rotor disc. So the dust settles, guys run out the back, and I lean up, and I hear a pilot go, oh, shit. And I look up, the forward rotor blades are right over the last, like, wall number four, the one they forgot to tell us about. Uh-huh. And the probe tip is rubbing, just tink, 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 wow. just rubbing on the edge of that thing, just little rocks crumbling off of it. And I was like, lesson learned. Count roads, count ditches, count berms, count walls. Yeah. And and I used to tell my guys that, you know, hey, when you're coming in, everybody looks at the imagery, you know, where's the fighting positions? Where's the target building? Where's the other stuff? I said, who gives a shit about that? Yeah, fighting positions are great. You're going to see all that stuff. But what are you landing on? Right. What are you crossing over? What is the train? Is it upslope? Is it, you know, lean to the right, to the left? That's the stuff you need to look at that's, you know, that you're going to tell that pilot to plan it down. Hopefully they're looking the same thing. Um, and that really, to kind of fast forward many years, that really saved, I think kind of saved our ass was number one. And I know he's watching tonight is Al Mack is one of the best pilots that ever lived. And number two, not to be humble, but he had one of the best crew in his right gun. <laughs> so I remember looking at him and, and, you know, he tells that story about, Hey, y'all remember, Remember hearing that Sante raid? And he tells the story in the book, and that's when I walked in and told my wife, I said, oh, my God, you ever hear me tell that story about, you know, the intentional crash landing in a helicopter in Vietnam? She goes, yeah. She goes, here it is. You can read it from, from his mouth. And that was the same thing. I remember crossing, like, you're going to cross a couple little ditches, little berm, and, you know, we didn't know how bad it was until Al made that come, and I leaned out the window, and again, and then I looked between the two pilots' heads, and I looked through the center console. I was like, my God. And I remember looking in and seeing his eyes in the mirror. Actually, you know, we had a rear view mirror in the cockpit. So I looked in that thing and I looked over and there he is with that big shit eating grin and that big <laughs> caterpillar mustache. <laughs> and but just seeing that and kind of seeing him laugh about it and the way he said it, he goes, Hey, y'all never ever heard of that Sante Raiden? Uh, yeah. I went, Yeah. Where they <laughs> Yep. So here's what we're gonna do. I was like, Oh my god. But yeah, um, that was some of the stuff was you know, the missions itself. Um, probably one of the biggest things was fast pace. You know, even when you're training and you're going out and doing bylats and stuff, you know, it's the crawl, walk, run, but the run in combat is really fast. Yeah. And really loud. Um, you know, when you've got a lot of stuff going on, the radios are going insane. Um, especially on the aircraft, you know, we got four or five radios kind of depend on what's going on. You got some, you know, Air mission commander sitting in the jump seat that can't figure out how to flip his switches and which button to talk to and which radio to talk to. You know, sometimes the captain, occasionally you get an experienced major, we'd get the battalion commander to fly with us. And then in the back, you got the ground force commander, you know, give a grunt, a mic switch, and you never know what's going to happen. So everybody wants to be on the radios. And then, you know, if you're shooting, you got miniguns going off. Um, it's just mass controlled chaos that moves super, super fast. Yeah. So it was, it took me a couple, it took me a couple missions to kind of get that frame of mind of going, Oh boy, I don't really have time to go back there and sit on the ramp and get my butt right. And, you know, wiggle the fast rope because you guys have seen me on the, on the 47, when you're doing the fast rope, we're outside, you know, we swing around or stand on the outside, standing up on the, you know, the stubby wing and the wheel, you know, exposed to the world. So you have to learn that, you know, while you're sitting on the ramp, rehearse it, you know, get your monkey tail right, tape it off, you know, get that little strap that we hang on to, make sure it's the right distance and, and tightness. So, because when you're in combat, you don't get off that gun until the very last second. Yeah. And when you get out there, you better make shits in order, because if not, it's going to get bad real fast. So just that fast pace and just the mass controlled chaos. That was that was new. Speak, speaking yeah. of controlled chaos, can you tell us a little bit about the hunt for Bo Bergdahl and how you got involved in that? <laughs> yeah. So, 
Um, a lot of big emotions on that one. You know, it's kind of one of those where, you know, I just wish we could fucking left that guy there, you know, left him to rock, you know. Um, but he's an American. We can get him to get a bear. So uh, that was the initial thing. We had come back, um, you know, from flying a mission. And uh, usually we'd come back. Guys, you know, we'd go to, you know, go to breakfast, you know, dinner. Um, and then we'd come back, shower, go to the gym, do whatever, go to the top, you know, debrief stuff, play some Call of Duty. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, go to bed. I'd, I'd run out, grab the sat phone. I'd call my wife, check on her and the kids. Um, you know, so by then, I think when, I think when Bo Bergdahl happened, my kids were like six and four, I think. So, you know, they get to hear their little voices kind of you know, give you some happy, you know, happy stuff. Um, and then go to bed. And then all of a sudden I remember getting kicked. Hey, wake up. Uh, they, they need you in the talk fast. Like, uh oh. So I ran in and, uh, you know, things are coming alive and happening real quick. And uh, Al, Al Mac, again, it's like a common denominator. You know, me and Al Mac were like, you know, and I was, I was talking to him the other day. And, uh, man, I think we talked for like five hours. Probably the first time we talked in 12 or 13 years. And we talked for like five hours just reliving stuff. Uh, and one thing I would forgot about, um, my very first reenlistment was on the ramp. We we're getting ready to go to Colorado to stay in a, we were literally staying in a ski lodge. You know, I was like, yep, this is it. And uh, I had to re-enlist on the ramp, and he was actually the officer that re-enlisted me for my very first re-enlistment. That's cool. Um, I'd, I'd been in the regiment less than a year at that time. So, yeah, it's like we were we were destined for greatness right off the bat. But, yeah, so um, he's like, hey, send everybody to the airplane, get them all up and running, get them up to engine start. We got to go. Like, okay. So we, we get everybody, all the crew chiefs, everybody runs down, start getting the airplanes ready. I stay up there to talk. Um, you know, sitting there with them. Uh, we had like a little flight simulator and like just a little, you know, little lap, like a little joystick. They could kind of plug the routes into it and uh, a real fancy version of Google Earth. And uh, they said, you know, we don't really know where this guy's at, but we're going to go do some stuff. We're just going to fly around. We're getting a little bit of, you know, SIGIN off of them, you know, picking up some translation stuff. Um, and we're just going to go fly around and see if we can stir up one of us and find this kid. So we launch, um, and we fly all night. And then we went into, you know, overflying vehicles, you know, seeing if we can get anybody to shoot at us, um, hitting some villages, dumping off the guys. They'd come back and say, well, he was here, but, you know, it was 30 minutes ago. We just missed him. Um, and then we went back to, uh, we went back to the airfield. We had to refuel, get some food. They brought out some breakfast. And uh, that was my first experience kicking speed. They gave us the old, uh, or they the the decks, the decks yes, and yeah. or whatever it's called. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Was it the yellow, yellow, blue bombers? I don't remember what color it was now. But well, I think the blue bombers comes were the, the, the sleepers, and the, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. We're, uh, we're 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 pretty pretty fucking tired. So he goes, we're good. Take one of these. I'm like, oh, we get to you know we've heard it, we've heard about it. I wasn't taking them for stuff in the past, but um, previous missions and deployments I'd been on, we'd asked for it. Um, cause we'd been out for 16, 18 hours and we had a commander was like, no, you'll be fine. That uh, was one of the hardest flights home you know, two hours from South, you know, from South of Kandahar back up to Bagram. Yeah. I found out that you can take the pack of, uh, for the, the chicken low main MRE. You can take that little pack of noodles and you can chew on that for two hours, just nibbling <laughs> like a little rat. That was kept me awake for two hours. It was one little noodle just at a time. So we took that Dex and, um, we went back out, and uh, that's where we had the infamous Sante. Uh, but we, yeah, we flew in. We planted that thing down there. Well, he did. Um, and, I mean, I seriously, I, I remember kind of bracing myself up against the heater closet and the gun, kind of like, all right, you know, if I'm going to hit, I don't want to bounce. You know, right. it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. Uh, and kind of squatting a little bit, you know, thinking that, okay, you know, bend my knees, you know, feet, knees, all that kind of stuff. And, uh leaned out started calling him in you know he took the controls over and he planted that sucker on a dime just like he was born to do it um probably still one of the, the best landings i've ever ever got to experience and uh we didn't break anything didn't crack anything got the ramp down far enough dude to jump off we took off and um uh, i think that was one it was i believe it was that one i was talking to him about this the other day i couldn't remember if it was that one or another one but we went up it was like a flat plateau that was running by the village a couple miles away. 
And we went up there and we sat down. We, we didn't shut down, but we just landed, let the guys do their thing. And, uh, you know, we're listening to the radios and waiting for the expo call. And it was like something out of an old Wild West movie where the, you know, you see the cavalry down in the valley and you look up and there's a little Indian sitting up on the little, the little flat plateau. That's what it was like. It was beautiful. Daytime, absolutely hate flying in the daytime in Afghanistan. You can't. And so people were like, why? I said, because you can't see anything. I'm like, but it's daytime. I said, yeah, but you can't see what you want to see. Right. Um, they, so they'll yeah, see they you before the, you see them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it became another dry hole. And um, we left. And uh, I rotated back, um, you know, a couple of days later. And, um, and then, history what, is what it is. What, what about the, uh, you said there's a, a vehicle interdiction that you guys did at one point? My favorite. Um, it's actually two of them. So um, we did, you know, we had, like earlier we were talking about the vessel, vessel interdiction that we were talking about in, uh, down in the Philippines and our flight lead at the time in Korea was an alpha company guy. He was an alpha company flight lead. So he'd, he'd done a lot of training stuff with the super cool dudes. Um, he was a prior SF guy, prior Ranger, you know, so he knew the ground stuff, pretty awesome, pretty shit hot dude. Um, so when we got to Afghanistan and stuff, um, we had been talking about doing the vehicle interdiction things. And that was another thing that, you know, Al had been talking about because, you know, we kept having guys run, you know, we'd have squirters on the target. We always had one aircraft that was the squirter patrol. So when you had guys run, um, I either wanted to be on the lead aircraft because if I was on lead, I knew everything. I knew everything that was going on because um, I hated not knowing stuff. Or I wanted to be on the squirter burden because that was the fun stuff. Well, everybody hits the target and goes off and hits the FARP and goes and chills out. We stay on target chasing dudes, you know, so that, that was exciting. So we kept having guys, you know, start leaving in vehicles. So that night, um, and, and the, the great thing about that night that made it even more special to me was before that mission, we had a little memorial service for, um, and I believe at the time that was for the guys that we lost on um, the whole um, lone survivor oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Red Wings. Mm. Turbine 33. So we had a little, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we had a little um, a little memorial service there um, for the guys. And, uh, you know, the Rangers were out there with us. <laughs> so we uh, did a little memorial service, wiped our eyes, said, all right, you know, it's time to strap it on and, and get busy. So we went down and... Um, at the time, when we took off, we were going to interdict a little Toyota station wagon, a little Toyota Corolla station wagon. So, you know, we've got, um, got the teams in the back. I'm on the lead bird, right gun. And uh, know, maybe five minutes or so, five or ten minutes before we got there, the car pulled off the road. Pulled off the road, went and hit in a little tree line. And they start unloading stuff. And they're walking down the tree line, and they're dumping it in a little cache side, like a little well, dumping it down a well. So we come in and, you know, our ISR platform, everybody's giving us, you know, what's going on. We got a couple of A-10s overhead and AC-130, you know, the, the typical Afghani package. And um, so we're, we're coming in and, and ground force commander clears us hot. He goes, hey, man, do your thing. Light it up. I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like instant, <laughs> you know, instant hard on. Let's do this. So, yeah, we roll in and, um, you know, same thing. Um, Al's in the left seat doing the flight lead stuff. I'm in the right gun. And uh, we had, it was kind of interesting that it wasn't, we weren't a solid Bravo company. Because at the time, I had gone back to Bravo company. After I did my first deployment, went back to Bravo company because we cross-leveled um, the, the company. So I'm back in Bravo company. And um, our other aircraft that was with us was actually an aircraft from 4th Battalion because we'd stood up 4th Battalion Lewis, and they were doing rotation. So we had a 4th Battalion crew. So when we come in, we're, we're going to split off. They're going to turn right and kind of plant it in a like an L-shaped formation. So they're going to break right with their left gun and everything facing the well and the tree line, which is all the way down at the end. We're going to keep going straight, plant it down, looking straight down that tree line right up the ass into that station wagon. So as soon as we come in, you know, the ground force commanders cleared us hot. Air, air mission commander everybody so we're on short final i flip the switch you know i flip the guard and hit that switch my little light comes on which is number one the first thing you want to see 
And then you're sitting there thinking in, in a split second, I'm thinking, man, I, I better not shit the bed on this. Cause if I do, I might as well, you know, write my letter and leave. So, you know, that's the one thing you never want to hear is the infamous burp. You know, you yeah. guys might've even heard it right in the hear that little what and then <laughs> silence. It's like a real, like a real fast spin up. We come in, we cross that little tree line and I see that car and I just hit the button and just lit into it. And, uh, Kind of the same thing. You know, we're browning out, so now it's the it's that orchestrated, you know, screaming into microphone, you know, counting them down, clearing them down, and then firing. So it's you know you you burp it, you know, one two seconds off ten, burp it off five, burp it three two one contact, burp it. So it's like a wah wah wah, you know, just coming in, and then we landed. I stopped for a second. Guys on the ramp, you know, ramp ramp ramp. They're coming down. They're running off. So the, the ground guys, they run off and turn left like they're going to run that way. And I lay on the gun and I just start ripping into the back of this, this little station wagon and whatever I see move. And then all of a sudden the, the dust is kicking up. So now I'm like, well, shit, <laughs> I don't know where anything's at anymore. Right. I'm going to sweep it. So um, it's great. The FLIR video from it was the, well, the A-10 video is pretty awesome because you get the A-10 pilots version. And they're like, holy shit. Yeah. You know, just watching stuff, peeling off of this car. It's 3,000 rounds a minute. You know, 50, 50 bullets a second are hitting this thing. The FLIR video, Al's got the FLIR turned to the right, so, you know, you can just see just sparks flying from the gun, the dust coming out. And I just laid into this thing for a good couple seconds, and then the guy in the back ramps up. I stopped shooting for a second. Hey, you're clear up left, right, you know, coming up. And then as soon as we cleared it, I hit it again and kept laying on it until he was out of sight. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is when we got back, you know, we screwed, we, <laughs> we lit that place up so bad that, um, the ground force started getting some, so we lit up the station wagon and the guys who were with that, the other aircraft started kind of shooting into the, the well area. The ground force didn't get to do anything. We, we stole all their thunder. Oh, they, they must have been, but, the must been butt hurt about that. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure their JTACs and their fire support guys were loving it because they broke, they broke off, they peeled back maybe, I don't know, half a mile to a little compound and they just watched the show over the wall. Yeah. They called in the A 10s, the 130. So it was kind of good. You know, the air guys got to get some action that night. So the A yeah. 10s plugged away some people that, you know, the C 130s got to, you know, shoot their cannons and, you know, pretend like they're Boy Scouts. Uh, but yeah, we got back to the, to the shop. You know, we picked everybody up, left. Um, didn't really know. You know, we just knew, hey, yeah, there's station wagon and stuff. And I get back and um, we go eat breakfast. Same thing, go eat breakfast, do whatever. Come back and I log into my laptop and somebody, I don't know, the IT guy, whoever, I don't know who it was. Still to this day, I have no idea who did it. But I fire up my laptop and my screensaver is two pictures of the station wagon and then like four pictures of, you know, with little little cards, you know, EKI number one next to station wagon, <laughs> EKI number two. I was like, Nice. That's like the best non Christmas present ever. So yeah. But that was that was a great one. And that's the thing that, you know, as crazy as it sounds, that is is probably one of the most special missions to me was um you know, I got back that night and you know, I was always told my wife, like, hey, it was a good night, it was a quiet night, you know, it was the busy but not bad. You know, she I think she picked up on the code word stuff and um I said, Yeah, I said it was a it was a great night and uh, we even the score tonight. <laughs> you know, so yeah, we lost uh we lost a crew and you know some good dudes a few years earlier and we didn't break even, but yeah. We got a whole lot closer. And, and then there, there was a and second the, one. I real, real yeah, quick, Daniel, so, <clears throat> Daniel, I'm really sorry. I I just want to make a point of order. You you refer to these uh, these nebulous beings called squirters. I I, I think that the the idea that the term maneuver element is uh, apropos. <laughs> this yeah. is be back before I got um, so PC. <laughs> yeah, or you know they're the they're, they're the ones that die a little bit more tired. Yeah, um, but yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. On their way to the cash. Yeah. So, yeah. So the uh, the other one is we did that station wagon, and then um, it was about and and. And a big thing, and I, and I kind of remember Al talking about this in one of his things, was it was kind of a thing that some of the commanders weren't really excited about. You know, they were kind of like, hey, you know, yeah, Little Bird's Blackhawks are doing this, but this is, <laughs> these are 
these are forty sevens, man. They're they're not the most maneuverable helicopters. <laughs> they're not the most sneakiest. You know, we're, we're you know you can hear us coming, but that is the absolutely shockingly surprising thing that a lot of people don't realize until they fly on one of just how maneuverable and crazy and wild these things can be and how we can actually sneak up on you. I mean, to kind of segue into a completely off topic, <laughs> um, we were at Fort Campbell training one day and my wife and kids and a couple of other friends were at a water park right there in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And we were just out burning gas, you know, just doing, doing training, just, you know, logging hours. And I said, Hey, uh, do you think we can fly over the water park on the way home? So yeah, sure. Well, what I didn't know is they were going to buzz this water park at like a hundred feet. <laughs> and I was telling her, I said, Hey, you know, we're, we're three minutes out. I'm giving her calls, you know, 10 minutes, <laughs> 10, six, three, one. And all of a sudden, you know, we break out over the trees and they dump it down over this park and there are umbrellas and towels flying everywhere. Everybody's screaming. Who the hell did that? And my daughter's like, that's my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, had no idea. So, surprisingly we can, we can sneak up on you pretty good. So the, the vehicle interdiction thing, I just don't think that they, they didn't think that we could do it. Um, but we'd gone out and done some training with it. And then, you know, I mean, we snuck up on that station wagon pretty damn good. Um, but the second one is absolutely to me is a hundred percent proof that 47s can, can do vehicle interdiction stuff. So same type of deal. And this one, we're in Sharana, you know, little, little bitty camp. On, I'm kind of on, on the East side and uh, they launch and say, Hey, we're going to go motorcycle. Um, we got two dudes on a motorcycle that are, you know, planting IEDs or digging in the dirt. And that was kind of the thing is, you know, they're not digging in the dirt in a road that's outside of FOB. They're not on a main road. This is a little dirt road in the middle of their own damn villages. And we're like, you know, what the hell? This this is and this is where you're kind of like, yeah, there's some bad people here that need to go away, and I'm going to help do that. Yeah. So we launch. You know, the idea is the, uh, the lead aircraft. Uh, we're going to try to get that vehicle to stop. You know, number one, we're going to plant this big-ass Chinook out their left window and go, hi, you might want to pull or, you know, tap on the window. Um, and if they still don't get their attention, we're going to shoot in front of them, kind of walk the bullets back and then you know, take out the engine stuff. Uh, but this time, this little guy, you know, two little dudes on a motorcycle, you know, it's like a little, you know, I don't know, like a little Honda, you know, 150cc little go-kart yeah. thing. And same type of deal as we're coming up on them. We've got two or three aircraft, you know, in trail. These guys are oblivious. They have no idea that we're sneaking up on them. And we're, we're not that far. We're a quarter mile away. And they're just being ring, 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 ring. Then they stop. They stop on the side of the road. They get off. Dude in the back takes off his backpack, takes a knee, starts digging. And we're creeping. You know, we've, we've kind of twisted it sideways. So we're sliding. You know, we're sliding right into them. And, again, Al's in the left seat. I'm in the right gun. And they're like, hey, what, is, what is this dude doing? I was like, he's digging in the dirt. And... That ground force commander sitting right next to me looks up at me, taps me on the arm, puts a big thumbs up in front of my face. Do it. I said, right guns hot, right guns engaging. And, um, you know, again, I think it goes back to my days of being, you know, eight years old with a BB gun. I hit that button, hit that laser, and initially, you know, you get about a split second of got them before you just can't see anything. It's dust. So I nailed the dude. Um, turns out I nailed him right in the head. You know, took off half, half his fist is gone. So he drops right then and there. Um, the second dude, Olympic marathon runner, man, he takes off at a sprint, um, running down the street, runs down the street around the compound, takes a right into a little cultivated field and thinks, ha they can't see me and lays down in like the prone with his arms out in front of him, just laying down in, in between the little cultivated rows. So we break off and you know, we shoot him up, break left second aircraft lands, dump the dudes off. They're going to do their, you know, SSE. And it's crazy. Nine years, 10 years. And I still remember these damn terms. That should ever happen. Like the stuff just magically comes back to you guys. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they start doing all the, uh, the SSE stuff. And, uh, we roll back around. We're like, well, let's, let's go find this dude. And, uh, sure. Shit. There he is. He's laying there. And, uh, so we had, uh, we had a sniper in the back and we had a big rectangle cutout window in the back. They've got a sniper for the team. He's back there, you know, with this nice fancy rig. You know, we've got the two forties in the back with the bars. So he's got a sniper rifle set up. He's taking shots. He sucks. Can't get it. 
he can't hit this dude. I'm he. I don't even know if he was even like around the team that next day. I'm like, you got one job, <laughs> snipe people, and you can't do it. So he says, I can't get him. You know, take him out. And so the ground force dude comes to me on the arm again, says, Hey, take him. So I flipped that switch, hit that gun a second time, lit him up right in the back, and uh, blew up his IED. Oh, so I took out his vest and everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was not expecting that. We didn't know he had on any kind of vest or explosives or whatever the hell he had. I don't know. But whatever I hit, um, there wasn't much left of him. And then, uh, you know, it blasted so big. We didn't, you know, didn't get anything out of it. But the flash knocked out my goggles for about mm. two or three seconds. You know, just went all black. I'm like, oh, shit. And then the light came back. <laughs> I'll never forget my, I think it was the, the, the uh, air mission commander in the job seat. Um, awesome, awesome dude. One of my one of my most favorite commission officers in the history of my military career. Um, it's that smell. <laughs> like that's dude. <laughs> that's, that's what blowing up dead guy smells like. But yeah, we got back and, and Al tells the joke. You know, people are like, "Oh, you know, what are you guys doing?" I'm like, "Oh, we're you know looking picking off body parts off the airplane." You know, we were that close. But yeah, those were those are two of my favorites. Taking out that station wagon just. Made it more special being that than that that station wagon and then the uh, motorcycle and then taking out that dude with the vest and that's another one that you know it makes it special because they're it's like they were doing it to their own people yeah you know, he's playing IEDs in his own damn village yeah you know what the hell is that yeah but, do we have yeah. uh, questions for Daniel those are good uh, let me see I we do let me. <clears throat> And uh, so, I mean, you did a, a 11 pumps to Afghanistan, and as things wind down, uh, 2010, you went over to Fort Rucker to do some instructor time? Yeah, um, you know, did a couple deployments, you know, a few more. Um, I think after the Bo Bergdahl thing, I think I did one more. And then, uh, you know, at the time, you know, at that point in time, I've only got, you know, 15, 16 years in the Army, but in the life of crew members, it's rare. Um, most of us get promoted. We move into, you know, flying a desk, as we'd call it, you know, platoon sergeant stuff. Um, I didn't want anything to do with that. I was like, no, my life is on that flight line. I'm, I'm a crew guy. Um, you know, when I, when I left the regiment in 2010 at that time, and I'd be curious to know, um, I had the most – Pretty much the most flight time and hours of anybody of any 47 crew member at that time. Um, you know, it's some people look at it as an achievement, some to brag about. I'm like, I don't know. That's just, you know, <laughs> probably should have stopped that a long time ago and said, you know, time to take a knee and do something easy um, because I was starting to feel it. Um, mm. You know, the back was hurting, the, the hips, the shoulders. Um, and of course, I wasn't saying anything. You know, go to the flight docs, take my annual flight physical. How you doing? How's the pain level? I'm like, I'm fan fucking fantastic. You know, because I took three Motrin 30 minutes before I showed up. Um, so, you know, things are starting to kind of regress on the physical side. Um, I think my wife was picking up on signs of it, but I don't think she wanted to say anything. Um, you know, I was never a fast runner. That was never a thing of mine. I was never the strongest, the fastest, but I was one of those guys that could go forever. You know, um, you need me to fly 15, 18 hours, stay up for three days, I can do it. No problem. So starting to have that conversation of, I think it's time. I think it's time to start taking a knee. Um, mentally, still still ready to go. But I am having those thoughts of, I've been pushing my luck. Mm. You know, mm. this is, you know, I've lost a crew in the Philippines. Um, I lost a couple crews in Bravo Company. And a lot of those, you know, it's not a survivor guilt thing, but it's like, damn, you know, they pulled me off because they were swapping out crews to do training stuff. So I missed that one. Mm -hmm. I just rotated out and the crew that just replaced me just lost it. So, you know, you start kind of looking at it going, damn, you know, how long is it going to be before my number's up? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm when I when I left, I think I was the only guy in the company that was a pre 9-11 crew chief. Oh, wow. You know, everybody else had started. <laughs> And there were some older old timer guys, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, the flight side and the reason is a lot of flight people, the, the crew chiefs and flight engineers, they promote pretty quick. 
Yeah. Um, you know, because they're getting NCYC time. They're they're in charge of trips. You know, so you're checking the blocks. You're getting all the schools. So, and when we get promoted, it's not like you know the SF teams who has the you know the 18 series or whoever. It's you know I'm a 15 uniform just like the guy that's at Fort Campbell in the 101st or wherever. So we're all promoting against the same people. Right. Um, so the lifespan of a crew chief and a flight engineer in the regiment is actually not really that long. The pilots stay there forever. You know, they show up and you are there for life unless you, unless you quit, you get fired or you, you retire and leave. You're there forever for the, for the crew members. It's not that way. Um, you can be depending on how you're, you're doing in life, but you usually tend to move up and move on and do things. So, um, yeah, I'm sitting there thinking, all right, I'm at about, you know, 11, 12 years. Physically, it started to take a toll. Um, my first sergeant at the time, um, Billy, amazing, amazing dude. One of my, probably one of my shit over 20 years, one of my top five, if not top three first runs I've ever had. And um, we went out for a run. It didn't go well. Came in, talked to him and said, yeah, I'm just not, I don't, I don't know how much longer I can do this before it's really going to start taking a toll on my future career. Um, so I think it's, I think it's best that I, that I go. And he was like, Hey dude, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? I said, well, as cheesy as it is, I think I'd like to go to Rucker. Um, it's non-deployable, you know, and it's not that I'm running away. Obviously I haven't been doing that. I've been doing it forever, right. but I think it's time to go home, settle down, you know, make sure my, my kids know who I am. Yeah. Cause those last couple of deployments, my kids started getting older. Um, you know, when we left Fort Campbell in 2010, um, my kids were seven and five. So the last couple of times, you know, my son's sitting there playing video games. I'm like, Hey dude, I'm, I'm leaving. And he just ran out by, you know, yeah. like it was just nothing. I'm like, okay. Yeah. You know, my daughter suddenly realized my dad's going away for a long time. And, you know, she's wrapped around my ankle, dragging her to the door, you know, screaming bloody murder and crying mm -hmm. all over the place. So I was like, I'm done with this. Yeah, I got to yeah, go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, um, we transitioned out, um, went down to Fort Rucker and, uh, had a wonderful time. You know, most people hate Fort Rucker. Loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. The, the unit I was in was great because we were dealing with test pilots. You know, so these are old season guys. You know, a lot of the people I worked with are, you know, senior maintenance guys, flight guys, older. Even one of the guys from my Panama days was a retired DAC flying for the test pilot course. So I'm like, this is great. It's like a family reunion. You know, so got to get involved with Boy Scouts, you know, helping raise my kids, you know, my wife, she's a, she's a superhero. I mean, I don't know. Uh, everybody would say, you know, thank you for your service. You're here. I'm like, no, I, I did it because it was fun and I love doing it. But that lady sitting next to me, yeah, she's a superhero. She, yeah. she kept the house going, the cat's alive, the kid's alive. I don't know how she did it. Um, you know, it's like my parents, people ask me, you know, what do you think if your kids were going to join the military? They're like, no. <laughs> I, I, same thing. I don't know how she did it. Um, especially, you know, knowing that some of her friends and some, one of our bestest friends in the world, um, Julie Quinlan, she was just down here with, uh, uh, one of her daughters. Um, we started doing family vacations every year. We'd come down to Orlando in October for the Disney Halloween stuff. Her husband died in Afghanistan and, uh, one of our aircraft that crashed over there as well. So, you know, with her being surrounded by it knowing that any day she could get that call. Her parents live right up the road, so she spent a lot of time um, there. Yeah. But she said, if, if I'm there at home, they don't know where to find me. So I didn't I didn't want to put them through any more of that. So we moved to Rucker, had a great time. Um, my, you know, as the military life goes, you know, you, you have best friends everywhere you go. So my, my, my newest best friend was a, a great guy there at Rucker. Um, you know, it's been a, you know, he's actually coming down here to Orlando for Veterans Day weekend. We're going to have a little four guys um, just getting away for the weekend, going to play a lot of golf. But, yeah, I met a great, wonderful group of people. Um, matter of fact, that's went to Chicago literally last weekend uh, to become a godfather to uh, to wow. his uh, brand new son. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, the people we've met. But Rucker was great. It was, you know, getting my feet back on the ground. Still flying, but it was all daytime. You know, yeah. I flew one goggle flight. They thought they might need it. It's like, great. Dan, you got like 3,000 hours in goggles time. Why don't you go out and do it? Man, after not flying goggles for like a year and a half, I had the biggest screaming headache. My yeah. neck hurt. And I was like, to hell with it. 
But the biggest thing that happened is when I got to Rucker and everything slowed down and I went to my very first flight physical, you know, when you get there, you got to go do the commander's eval stuff and get your, get your upslip. I sat down. And as soon as I sat down, the flight surgeon goes, man, have you ever, ever been in a helicopter crash? I went, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Um, and she's like, no, seriously, just the way, and it's kind of like the way I'm sitting right now. I prop my arm up and you know, just kind of loosen everything up. The next thing you know, I'm getting dragged around to the orthopedics guy, the physical therapy guy. I'm getting x-rays because they're at Fort Rucker. The hospital's tiny. Everything's right there. She walked me in, physical therapy. Yep, you are you got an appointment. X-rays. Yep, we got x-rays. We put a, a referral out for an MRI. By the way, it's in the trail in the parking lot. So all of a sudden, I'm finding out that it's not just a mental thing. I really was mm, yeah. broken. Um, I had two shoulder surgeries. Um you know, it's fun. I'm like a half inch shorter than I was when I, when I joined the army. Yeah. Um, they have to have a knee surgery, but they gave me this fancy little brace to keep my kneecap in the right spot. Cause apparently I'd, I hadn't torn one of my little tendons, but I'd ripped like halfway through it and it had kind of healed itself, but crooked. So I wore this little brace with a little kind of a, like a little lump on the side of it to keep that thing straight. And now that thing's working pretty good, but yeah. I mean, all of a sudden it's like, Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It adds up. <laughs> it really was broken up. Pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say when you when you said that, you know, it was a test pilot and all these guys were salty and, you know, all, all the crew were salty that it's probably one of the reasons you guys all probably got along is everybody there had compression fractures. And uh, and so you all just hobbled along together. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of funny. I mean, you, you, especially at Rucker, there's a lot of DACs, a lot of civilian guys. So in our in our maintenance test pilot course. Um, we only had one active duty pilot and he was the, the track chief. Everybody else was retired. Um, so, you know, yeah, walking in and, and some of these guys were, you know, and a lot of pilots don't retire at 20 because by the time they're up in the senior ranks, they're a W4, W5. Yeah. They're a miss. You hear of them, you see their name on an office, but you never see them. They're spark, their parking spots always empty. Right. So yeah, it was a bunch of old farts rolling around in the wheelchairs. Yeah. Um, but it was great. Um, and, and the thing that I really enjoyed about that, too, was um, even though the regiment was flying at that time golf models, which is very similar to the Fox model nowadays, um, their pilots would still have to roll through the big RP instructor courses. So if they wanted to be an instructor pilot or an IP or a, a maintenance test pilot, they still had to go to Rucker, take the, the big Army qualification course, and then they would go back to you know, the regiment to, to get their more in-depth specifics. So I still got to see a lot of old buddies. A lot of the old pilots would come down. So we got to, you know, relive war stories and, yeah. and, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, I think a lot of people are like, Oh, whatever. Dan's telling stories again. And then some guy would run in and he goes, Hey, I was the right seat on that station wagon. Yeah. That's legit. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it was, it was good. You still got to stay. It's still kind of like being in the community, but detached. You know, yeah. we still had guys roll through, but yeah, it was definitely, kind of, we were all uh, old, broken, for, uh, miserable. Daniel, we only have one, uh, but I, I want to ask you one last question. Cause this is, uh, I'm curious about it. Having flown for everybody in JSOC and probably, you know, everybody in SOCOM, not, I'm not talking about gear. I'm not talking about the number of personnel, but when people got on that aircraft, could you tell who they were by, by just their posture in the aircraft, how they occupied their aircraft, how they treated each other in the aircraft? Um, you could. Um, you kind of had me worried there for a minute. I thought you were going to say, hey, of all your customers, who do you like flying with the best? I was like, Ooh. No, because that's <laughs> obviously Rangers. Don't make I mean, that one. Yeah, it's obviously um, Rangers. Like, yeah. How many Rangers can you fit on a Chinook? All of them. Uh, one more. Yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. Um, now, of course, now we're like, hey, one of you got to get off. <laughs> right. You know, well, there's only seven. Right. We can only take six. <laughs> um, yeah, you kind of could. Um, you know, I mean, it was always cheap because we did know who we were getting. But, um, you know, there wasn't, uh, of course, obviously the Rangers. Yeah, we, we knew because um, they're like, I don't know, they're like spit shine, polished, ready to go. Um, they're they're like little robots. Um, amazing. Um, you know, don't let your head get swelled up there a little bit, but yeah, they're, that's, that's, they that's, were good to work with because Rangers, I never, never had an issue with Rangers trying to be bossy because it's like, they fully understood, Hey, 
we're just hitching a ride, man. This is your claim. You tell us what to do. Um, so they were always like, you know, um, and it's kind of funny, you know, in the special ops world, rank didn't really mean much. You know, it was who's the team leader, who's the team sergeant, who's the chief, who's the whatevers. Yeah, those guys would bark. But the Rangers were still like very, you know, yes, sergeant, no sergeant, do this, do that. So, you know, when they rolled up to me and they're just, you know, staff sergeant Divine standing on the edge of the ramp and all my kid like, hey, go here, do this, put your stuff there, hang that, don't touch this. Roger Sarton, I'm like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> we don't even do anything. <laughs> right. But, um, um, you know, the dev group guys and the CAG dudes, um, for the longest time, um, dev group was our main customer in Afghanistan, you know, because they couldn't get along in the early days. So it's kind of like, all right, <laughs> CAG dudes, you get Iraq, dev group, you're getting Afghanistan because we can't even put you in the same theater without, you know, jeopardizing each other's stuff. <laughs> Um, and those guys were good too. I mean, I really had a good working relationship with them. I mean, it's funny, you watching some of the podcasts, I see some of these guys, I'm like, man, I feel like I know you, but you know, you, we all got, you know, most of them big beers now, bigger than they were. Um, but every once in a while, you, you could, you can almost tell who the new guy was, like who the new team chief was or new team leader. Cause it's like they try to come in and strut their stuff. Um, but overall, they were pretty good dudes. And when, you know, towards the end of my regimental career, we swapped out. We actually rotated out um, the SEAL dudes with the with the uh, CAG guys. And it was a little headbutt at first um, because they wanted to roll in and were like, no, we don't care what those guys did. This is how we do it. And we're like, well, they did it because that's how we told them to do it. You're going to sit there. Your mic cord is going to be here. Your green chem lights are in bat flap. Your blue chem lights are in bat flap. Don't move anything. Um so those guys, you know, just big burly dudes with a whole lot of shit coming on board. Um, they they were the same. The Rangers were definitely you could tell um, how they 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 were dressed right, dressed everybody looked the same. You know, their their shit was wired tight. Um, the other dudes, you kind of was like, hey, whatever makes you comfortable, whatever you can carry. So it wasn't a big, you know, difference on what they had. Um, toys, you could tell yeah. by some of the toys they had. Yeah, you know, like oh, okay. <laughs> you know, um, you got some pretty fancy stuff there. Um, so yeah, that was kind of some of the differences there, but they were all, um, and I think that's one thing I definitely love being in the special operations world for, for those 12 years was it really didn't matter everywhere you went that you knew that these are the professionals, whether, and you know, there's a lot of talk about like, especially in the early days, pre, pre, pre nine 11, you know, with the, Oh, you're white soft, you're black soft, right. you're this. Yeah, okay, I want you to go up and just tell a Green Beret from 7th Group that, oh, you're just SF. Right. Yeah, say that, run fast, run real fast, because he's going to whoop your ass. Um, you know, so I think that was the cool thing was, you know, when I, growing up early days of working with, you know, just regular Navy SEALs and Green Berets, to me, those dudes are badass. You know, that, that was, I didn't know the difference. I'm like, these dudes are pretty awesome. The shit they're doing is pretty crazy. And then when I started working with the, you know, the other side of the house was like, man, I almost want to go back and work with those guys because y'all are like a bunch of little bitches running around. You're whining and crying about every little thing. It's too hot. Can we get cushions on the floor? We're in a 47 at 15,000 feet in the mountains of Afghanistan. It's going to be cold and we're not cranking up that heater. So deal with it. And I'm not closing the windows and pulling the guns in. So yeah, they, they would they'd whine and cry a little bit, but um, overall, Everybody was awesome. It was it was an amazing amazing ride. Well, I'll, I'll, I mean, and and Jack can vouch for this too. Like, I'll I'll say that anybody who's ever flown with the one sixtieth, like you know that that you are flying with the best of the best, and and not just the pilots but the crew. Like, it, like it is such a professional organization, and everybody is so shit hot that it, it, I. I like, I don't even know how to, like, how to emphasize that without just, like, fanboying all over, you know. It's okay. We're used to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Small-ass motherfuckers. Got a, a question <laughs> here. Uh, DJ Sneed, thank you very much. What's the difference between the 160th SOAR and Delta Force's aviation unit? I'm going to say if there is such a unit. Uh, is there a selection process or is it just a tasking? So, um, yeah, there is a little thing out there. Um, so just kind of like, 
you know, guys that want to assess and go, you know, go work out at BAM Neck or whatever, there is a uh, an aviation group that is a little bit more personalized and special um, that there is an assessment for and a selection. It's basically kind of the same thing. When you head out to uh, West Virginia and do your thing or West Virginia, Virginia, wherever it is. Um, but yeah, there there is a little thing up there, but it's more um, – learn a lot more about civilian um, helicopters because um, that's their thing. Where ours, you know, for us, for the 160, it, it's it's a special operations world, but we're, you know, there is some little sneaky stuff that guys do. Um, not so much necessarily for the 47s. Little Birds do a lot of that stuff. Um, the Blackhawks, some. Um, but, you know, our, our bread and butter is we're going to go do the big, nasty, dangerous stuff yeah, that sure. that only stupid people would try. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> that, that's uh, Right. We're like, yeah, we ain't never done this before, but let's give it a shot. But that's because we have the resources. And that was the thing, you know, when I got to Fort Rucker and and really kind of got to, you know, meet some big Army guys that had been flying a long time and had done deployments with the big Army stuff. And there was always a lot of, you know, a lot of shit talking between the conventional Army guy and the 160 dudes, you know, the you know next stop, Dairy Queen, all that kind of stuff. I said, well, you know, either number one, you didn't have the balls to try. So shut your mouth, you know. And number two is you tried it. You were horrible. You sucked. You got fired. So shut your mouth. You know, if you've never done it, don't talk shit. Um, because there are times where we would get back and you would just shut the engines down. You just sit there, you know, for 30 seconds. And you just sit there and just kind of go, holy shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and then the big army guy's like, ooh, I flew eight sling loads in one night. I'm like. Uh, great, super. Why don't you go do that again? Um, we just flew from, I mean, even just like training stuff. I mean, to to fly from Fort Campbell, Kentucky to Albuquerque, New Mexico without ever touching the ground in a helicopter because you had to in-site refuel, you had to do all kinds of stuff. And for one, to, I mean, just think about flying in an airplane in your seat on a 737 for 12 hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you're wearing all your shit. Yeah, you got your heads on, your helmet, you got your night vision goggles. Yeah. You know, you're, you're peeing in gator bottles. You, know, you had some soggy hamburgers from 10 hours ago. That hope aren't gonna make you sick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just basic stuff like, so yeah, um, it was, there's a, there's a difference between that little bitty thing that they have and us, um, because they're a more of a, an individualized, you know, you're just going to go out in onesies, twosies and try to sneak in and do something mm-hmm. where we're going to take a bunch of helicopters and try to fuck some shit up. Right. Yeah, uh, and that was the only question. I just want to say that uh, Alan was in the chat quite a bit, singing your praises. <laughs> um, and and I think you owe him a drink. And absolutely, yeah, Daniel, I owe him many drinks. Thank thank you so much for coming on the show tonight, and you know, kind of re- representing not just one sixtieth, but representing like crew chiefs. So like I said, we never had one flight engineer. Fl- what, what is it with you guys? Why do you why why are you trying to demote him? Uh, it does just a subtle <laughs> a subtle jab. Uh, no, but but for representing yeah the flight crews and the flight engineers uh, because we've never had them on the show before, and and I don't think there's too many podcasts out there that have really interviewed you guys. And I mean, I think it's awesome that you can come on here and kind of tell that a, a piece of that story. Um. And again, thank you for doing it. And uh, is there anything else you want to tell people about, like what you're up to today, or where people can find you, or anything? Um, yeah, man, I'm just down here in Orlando, um, loving life. Um, you know, in between hurricanes, um, but yeah, it's um, just hanging out. You know, my kids now are 18 and 20. Uh, my daughter's 18. My son's 20. Um, so, you know, been out. You know, retired now for nine years, hanging out and just having a great time. You know, awesome. Anybody's ever down here in Disney World to include you guys if you ever make it down here. It is Epcot International <laughs> Food and Wine Festival right now. So uh, I, I may have in line free tickets because I got a couple kids in the house and a wife that actually works for Disney and my daughter does too. So yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's like, you know, catching up on the the nine, ten years of, yeah, you know, missing yeah, out on my kids. That's growing. Right. Yeah. No, we it, made up that. Yeah. It, it's uh, yeah. like, it's, it, you know, it, sort of takes that moment of self reflection to say what I'm doing, I'm doing for me. And there are people in my life that depend on me. Uh, and you know, and now it's their time. 
yeah, and that's kind of what it was is, you know, those those 20 years, especially those 12 in the regiment, that was you know, kind of looking back, it's like, man, I was pretty pretty selfish dude, yeah. you know, it's like, hey, it's I got to go on a trip, I got to go on a deployment, I got to do whatever. And then, you know, the family's back home, they're like, what about them? It's like, yeah. they're taken care of. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And um, and then all of a sudden you slow down and you look back in the rear of your mirror and you're like, holy shit, what did I do to yeah. my family? You know, why? what did they ever do to deserve this? Yeah. But, the, but that's so, how it is for everybody. I, I make it up. Yeah, that's how it is for everybody in the soft. Everybody's living their dream life and leaving, you know, leaving everybody behind to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And guys, any of your, yeah, give me a call. Look we're me coming up. down. The three of us. You, you, you already uh, volunteered. We so. know a lot of cats down there. Um, and <laughs> before uh, before we take off, I do want to tease out tonight um, the next event that Badger Six is having. Um, so it's Ruck the River 2023, and the American Legion uh, that I belong to in Hoboken, New Jersey, is hosting this event. Uh, Ruck the River was created to support Badger 6, which provides humanitarian assistance to families of the Afghan cavalry who fought alongside the CIA's Team Alpha and the U.S. Army Green Berets of ODA 595. Join us as we pay tribute and assist those who stood by our warriors in Afghanistan. And you can find them at HobokenLegion.org slash Ruck23. Um, we've done you know some stuff with Badger 6 in the past. Uh, Justin, Justin, uh, Mike's fan's wife, uh, Shannon, yeah, uh, um, David Tyson. So uh, that's the next event that they have coming up. I hope you guys will participate. You know, if you're local to the area. Um, other than that, I just want to say um, our friends at Casa Carabeo Cigars, CasaCarabeo.com. If you want to pick them up, they're outstanding. Uh, other than that, we'll see you guys next week with Mike Edwards, former former teammate teammate of mine. Uh, he will be here in studio, Ranger Battalion dude. Uh, so you know it's good and Daniel again man thank you for doing the show uh, wish you the best man hope to see you down there yeah guys thanks for having me on man um, I love what y'all are doing you know getting the you know getting that getting those stories out to people that you know there's a real life element to it yeah hell well, yeah and you know, thank, not just thank, thanks for like, you see on week. yeah thanks for spending a Friday night to come on and share your story we, we really appreciate it absolutely thank you very much guys you have a wonderful night it's been a pleasure you too man you have too. a nice weekend and uh we'll see all you guys next friday with mike